the White House, President Eisenhower signs the proclamation that makes Alaska's entry into the Union official, nearly 92 years after Lincoln, Secretary of State, bought the territory from the Russian Tsar for $7 million. The Alaska Wild Project podcast is brought to you by the following sponsors. Tailored Restoration 24-Hour Emergency Home Services, helping Alaskans restore their dreams since 1972. Services include fire, water, mold, post-emergency cleaning, repair, and remodeling. Give them a call in Anchorage, Eagle River, Matsu, or Fairbanks. Hit them up at tailoredrestorationalaska.com. Looking to buy or sell a home? Look no further than Alaska's number one real estate team at alaskashometeam.com. Decades of local experience knowledge and expertise in the competitive real estate market alaska's home team makes buying or selling your home a breeze give them a call today at 907-277-3777 lady with the plan your own alaska event planner from scouting the perfect location to planning the tiniest details specializing in event management and production for intimate social gatherings retreats birthdays bridal and baby showers find lady with the plan on instagram The Bait Shack, located on Ship Creek upstream of the bridge. Can't miss the bright red shack. They're the go-to fishing gear rental and guide service on Ship Creek. Tight lines and fish on. Come hook into the action with them. Hit them up at thebaitshackak.com. Double Shovel Cider Company, located off of Arctic and 58th handcrafted alaskan made colonial ciders they also have a tap room downtown on the corner of fifth and e stop by today and taste an award-winning cider ako farms located in sitka alaska built from the ground up with concentrates as their single motivation find their products such as their sugar wax full spectrum diamond sauce carts and more at the treehouse ak and other dispensaries around the state ask your local bud tender about ako the treehouseak.com located at 341 Boniface Parkway, Alaska's own and grown cannabis and CBD store. Ask the bud tender what the strain of the day is to get your 10% off. The Treehouse, where the culture lives. Marijuana has intoxicating effects and may be habit forming and addictive. Marijuana impairs concentration, coordination, and judgment. Do not operate a vehicle or machinery under the influence. There are health risks associated with consumption of marijuana. For the use of only by adults 21 and older, keep out of the reach of children and marijuana should not be used by women who are pregnant or breastfeeding. Serrano's Mexican Grill, two locations, one on Tudor, one on Northern Lights. The Northern Lights location has their new tequila bar. Check it out. Also see their daily specials at serranosmexicangrill.com. Lawn Pro AK, Alaska's year-round professional property maintenance team. Services include snow and ice management, weekly lawn care, and more. Get your free estimate today at lawnproak.com. I had a problem with it. They're just like, just keep moving we got to get the work done and we had to drag these fucking boats 300 yards up and down through these shitty ass like it's not like manicured fucking trails out there and i'm just sweating and i'm scared i'm terrified and i'm mad and i'm just like this is bullshit you're not having any fun i'm just like brian you didn't tell me you were gonna like just like oh yeah yeah jj go out there and do that you know yeah like and i'm just like no one was carrying a gun. No, no. And I thought it was the dumbest thing I've ever done in my life. And they were just like, you're stupid for even like, let's just yeah, get this done. Why are you about worrying that? about yeah, yeah. And I was like, because I saw the bears. Yeah. I saw them. Yeah. Because you're a real person. I'm not person. wondering. I saw them. They're down here. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't like way over there, yeah. 20, no, we, 30 we, miles. we circled them and then we landed. And but now you're circling them in the woods. <laughs> You're yeah, circling yeah. you. That did was you, some hard ass work driving did, those boats through the fucking brush. Justin, throw your headphones on. Okay. Did you uh <laughs> did you have an encounter? When that got, day? When we got back to the uh plane, mm-hmm. about I would say fifty to seventy five feet. After there, all the work was done. The, there, there was two or three bears just standing there. Just the watching the same side of the bank. And I was just like, God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> What did I get uh, myself into? Uh, huh? You know, I was like, I can see the plan. I can get in there and hide, you know, or whatever. But I was like, that was, I just felt like that was not, inte- that was not an intelligent um, activity or, or chore that we just did. And I was, 
Like people get really comfortable walking uh, around full bears, man. Yeah, they're and, just and full, they, and they didn't care. Yeah, they didn't care. No. And I want. I was thinking about all the, how I was going to motherfuck Brian when I got back to the lodge <laughs> <laughs> and be like, like that's not cool, dude. You yeah. Like I don't like I work for you, but I don't work for you. Yeah. Like I'm not. I don't work for you out here at the lodge. I work for you in Anchorage. I go to Costco. I go to ours. Fred Meyer. I go to Lowe's. I grab bolts and shit. Like yeah, I've yet to see a bear there. I don't come out to the woods and shit. And, you know, <laughs> grab boats. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. Yeah. Uh, right. <laughs> I got time to pee again. Yeah, go pee. Welcome oh. to Alaska Wild Project, yeah. episode number forty-nine. Uh, the voice you just heard there is our guest today, uh, number forty-nine, Justin Johnson, uh, who had to go pee. He's got a. He broke the seal, man. Yeah, he broke the seal yeah, early. <laughs> yeah, we had him in here early, saying some stories. Um, I was making that first note, <laughs> Justin Johnson's <laughs> first bear encounter. <laughs> what a great start to the show, though. That was perfect, man. Oh, man. Hey, uh, thank you. Thank you very much to oh. all the uh, new Patreon members, those of you that uh, signed up to be a Patreon member. Um, we do have the new hoodies in, and I think mm. we're going to throw them up on the website. Um, yeah, there'll be some pictures works. coming up soon uh, for that, so thank you for that. And if you haven't left us say Apple Podcast review, um, you know that all, all that little stuff helps us. And just subscribe to the YouTube channel, um, you know, our Instagram page or whatever. All that little stuff helps uh, just to kind of get the word out and uh, trick the uh, the old um, internet into getting this podcast and stuff out to uh, to more people out there. Um, Jackie, how's the slopes been going? It's been pretty, going pretty good. The uh, you know the I have the five and a half year olds haven't jumped off the chairlift on purpose yet. We got them uh, up the tram, uh, right, night skiing, so uh, tearing it up there. Lots of jumps, uh, and then lots of like getting on top of like little cliffs and then having total breakdowns where they they get scared and so I gotta kind of hike hike back up. Yeah. Maybe don't run into the woods and look for cliffs anymore at five um no. <laughs> yeah like yeah. Eight. yeah lots of hot tub time too so uh yeah we, we've been tearing it up i think i think they have 15 days now. no 16 now they have 16 days as a sunday on nice. the mountain did you ski on sunday alexia ended up going out and she picked that day because it's supposed to be bluebird and yeah. nice and it was like just the shittiest just like sock day yeah so <laughs> so i went back to anchorage mm -hmm. on sunday did not ski the kids did i didn't and then uh uh, the hot, something happened in the hot tub. I had to go down to fix it. And then I was, I looked and it was going to be a bluebird the next day. So I stayed the night and I was like, oh, I'm playing hooky. So I got up early, did you know, remote working from, yeah. the, from the hot tub. Um, the, you know, iPhones are nice. And then, uh, there's this cloud cover. It was at like 200 feet. And I was like, fuck man, like low ceiling. This is going to suck. But go up the, the tram there and it's just bluebird above that. And it's like, I think it's after, well, the 4th of February, the the sun comes up over the ridge and, like, shines in the bottom of the bowl. Mm -hmm. But it must be, like, right now because on, on Monday it was uh, the sun hit that whole ridge line in the main face of the mountain. So I just skied in the sun all day. It was it was awesome. That's awesome. Good day. B, Rilla, go Rilla. What'd it do? Me and B went out to uh, Finger Lakes. Oh, you did? But yeah, man. We went yeah. out there early, out there before the sun came up. Um, did a little ice fishing out there. Oh, checking that's out some why it was like a nighttime drill. Yeah. Auger, I saw that. Yeah, right. that was a 7 a.m. drill. It made All some right. cool pictures, man. Yeah, was, they came uh, out pretty good. That was way cool, man. We're trying to find the trout out there. Um, we kind of went a little, remember we went the whole family. Alexi caught that nice trout. Oh, yeah, that day. yeah, yeah. We kind of went further that way around uh -huh. the next bend, um, thinking over there. I think we got some more... Uh, research to do yeah yeah mm -hmm. and see where they're at we, we were all into the little landlocked ones yeah but yeah trying to catch one of them trout out there there's got to be some oh yeah boys out there oh, oh there is sure. yeah it was a good time man it was a nice little short trip yeah yeah Got back into town to catch the football games oh yeah. you did yeah we went for like two and a half three mm. hours we made the mistake we were like out fishing hard you know just catching them one by one pow, 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 pow. and then we're like hey let's uh let's go get in the truck and get warmed up yeah that was the end of that yeah then you get back out and you're like yeah fuck that man i'm done <laughs> time to lock it up oh that's funny all right well uh welcome like i said to episode 49 uh justin johnson's in the house with us jj thanks for coming man welcome man i uh i was uh i like to google people and see what what pops up when they come in and um 
I just want to read off all this and see if there's something missing here, right? Obviously, maybe Wendler, but East High, Bozeman Ice Dogs, Danville Wings, Omaha Lancers, UAA, Alaska Aces, Utah Grizzlies, Cincinnati Cyclones, Manchester Monarchs, Bridgeport Sound Tigers, New York Islanders, Alaska Aces, Toronto Marlies. Is that it? Been around. That's Nailed a lot. It. Been around, man. That's a lot of leagues. Yes. That's Now that's all roller hockey? <laughs> people watch me skate they might, say, they might say that <laughs> that's what they want to say but I, I thought I skated okay yeah you were a hell of a skater yeah, yeah, yeah. you did good yeah. let's get into the history of it um, yeah, man. like what what got you st- uh, started into skating and, and playing hockey and like what age was that were you like uh, AHA or jump right into North Stars or what was it I was uh, my grandma lived on uh, off of Patterson East Anchorage Mm-hmm. Um, off Madeline and Laren, right there where the uh, Senior Park Church and elementary school was. And uh, I was babysat by the Carters. They had a bunch of kids. Uh, they played soccer. And there's a hockey rink right there. Scenic Park you're talking about? Scenic Park. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, it was just something that I just did because that's what their kids were doing, mm-hmm. you know, as, a, as an activity. Um and, uh, you know, my dad was uh, black and uh, from South Carolina. Um, so hockey wasn't ever anything that was introduced in the house. He yeah. was a military guy. He was stationed at, uh, you know, Jay Bear now, Elmendorf then. And my mom worked for an ENT, ear, nose, and throat. And, uh, you know, you, you go a few times, and, and then all of a sudden they introduced uh, gym hockey. Uh, mm. Oh, floor shit. hockey, dude. Oh, yeah. Elementary yeah. school cool. was floor hockey, it was man, with those work. plastic sticks. Yeah, dude. Yeah, yeah. just bend it. And, uh, Coach Dye introduced me to that. Oh, and, yeah. You know, you'd get those handouts from your teacher, you know, when we're in elementary school. You first sign up for soccer. Oh, yeah. Volleyball, yeah. basketball. Before or after school. AHA, and I think there was a Snoopy on it, so maybe that's why all of a sudden I like, paid attention because I would take like a lot of my homework it went in the trash. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I remember being something I put in for my mom. Like, I want, I want to do this, you know? Um, and it was like, Oh hell no. Like no way. And, uh, so, uh, that just happened to be a time in my life where my parents are getting divorced mm. and, um, you know, we're starting that whole visitation thing. And, you know, I had younger, younger brothers. So, uh, you know, we're in daycare or whatnot. And uh, me being much older than them, I think my mom was really good about um, just giving me my thing. And uh, that was, you know, she'd come home, pick me up from the daycare, take me to Diamond Center, give me 10 bucks, and I would skate at Diamond Center. And it's a true story. Yeah. I was there by myself. Can you imagine? Like, I'm, I'm like oh, envisioning uh, oh, it right uh, now. 1989. <laughs> oh, you know, 1990. Just <clears throat> that's nice. My mom would drop us off at the Lusak Library. Yeah, yeah. not as fun. <laughs> yeah, <that's the> <laughs> and uh, got the MC Hammer pants just out there skating. And I, I wonder if I'm forgetting somebody, or maybe there was somebody she knew that was looking after me. But uh, <laughs> I'd skate for the whole afternoon, and when I, my feet got tired, I'd, I'd take my ten bucks, go down to Bosco's there, mm-hmm. the Diamond oh, Center, yeah. go get some cards. I buy no bubble gum. Okay. Mm-hmm. You know, that, that hard Joe. ass. The bazooka yeah. job. Yeah. That, you know, just, was just break your teeth. That our teeth, well, at, you know, nine, eight, nine years old, we our teeth were invincible too. That's and, true. Uh, yeah. I'd get a cheeseburger and I'd be back on the ice and, uh, you know, getting yelled at by the Diamond Chile staff. And then she'd come get me after work. And uh, then it was street hockey. Mm. And I would say that, um, you know, Maybe through you know just that whole thing, working in a doctor's office and meeting other people whose kids were playing hockey. I, I you know, I got signed up. Yeah. Did you? Yeah. Uh, would you say you learned to skate on your own? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, not, so I'd say that's kind of like people, some people liken me to like an octopus. You know, <coughs> I don't have a classic skating style, but uh, you know, I'll just I won't. I try not to go down the rabbit hole too much. But when I got signed up for learn to skate, it was at AHA, <coughs> and this is a true story. Um, walked into Ben Boki, you know, looked to my right and looked to my left, and I saw another white lady with blonde hair, and her son had a nappy ass, one sided, you know, tilted afro, and it was Mike Lee. <laughs> oh, wow. And uh, I sat next to him. Yep. And my jersey was a t shirt, and we were doing uh, Learn to Skate. Nice. And that's where it started. Yeah. That's really where it started. 
Wow. Oh, you guys go back that far? Yep. No, I've got, I got pictures that are probably, you know, weather or water soaked, but uh, where his feet are at my face, you know what I mean? And uh, where we were spending the night and things like that. We actually started playing hockey together. Yeah. Oh, well, that's awesome. Well, that's a yeah. great story. He man. went red and I went blue um, <laughs> to start, and I eventually made my way back to the, I don't know what you would call it, but, you know, the uh, I would say maybe the, the, the color of, of uh, the organization that was really kind of putting kids forward, I would say, uh, after the initial North Star yeah. push. You know? mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, there was H- a. HA started it. The, man, I remember, like, I, my dad put me in AHA, and, and I remember just thinking it was only, like, North Stars or All Stars. That was, yeah. like, the main two. And then maybe there was, like, the Wolves or something else like yeah. that or something. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was, like, to be on one of those teams was, like, elite. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. there's like elite. Like, I knew f- 100% I was never going to be on one of those teams because I was like, I taught myself how to skate and I just was like, you know, a baby deer out there, just yeah. a w- little skinny <laughs> kid, you know what I'm saying? But I just remember that it was like, the good kids are choosing, like, am I going to be on the North Stars? Am yep. I going to be on the All Stars? Or the you Bulldogs. Know? Or, yeah, or, or the Bulldogs. Bulldogs. Yeah, that Bulldogs, was another yeah. one. Yep. Yeah. It was pretty popular when I was in school. Was was bulldogs in, in in junior high, but they that was a short little stint the bulldogs had I think right like, they did but it was a good one yeah it no, really was good. a good one there was a lot of good hockey that players came like, out of the bulldogs Fra- coach Fraley and yep. and I, I, was he kind of like the lead yep. dog coach of that yep that Corbin crew? and you know like for you know for example Corbin Schmidt mm, yep um, mm-hmm. but uh, I'll probably iterate more it's just kids that want to play hockey. Mm-hmm. Things are so much simpler then. Yeah, ain't that you the know? truth? Like, obviously, everyone want to be in the All Stars. Oh yeah, you know what I mean. Everything started with the North Stars, but then it became the All Stars because it was more of that Maverick thing with the Cusacks. Yeah, mm. um, the sweet track you know, suits. And you know, I, I would yeah. say that you know things that we weren't aware of when we were you know <clears throat> kids, but you know, I'm sure Michael Cusack, Doctor Michael Cusack, was doing a good job of recruiting the best. XUA and Aces guys to come out and coach his association and, and, and it shows. Yeah. It really does. Now when you look at it, look back at it. Yeah, that seemed to have uh, kind of lost track maybe after our generation as far as um, that competitive. I mean, there's obviously still competitiveness within hockey, but it seems like they kind of broke that up where they used to um, kind of make that powerhouse team or two teams that could really go and compete mm-hmm. down in the States. And then they kind of, like, broke it up. Like, you know, they like broke up the Monopoly or something like that. And now it seems like ever since then, there hasn't been much, except for the girls, there's been a lot of girls teams that have gone mm-hmm. down and, and, and gone down and done well in nationals and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, because we still have select teams that yeah. group up and go. And mm-hmm. I know Waldrop's got a hell of a squad that mm-hmm. competes at a high level. And, um, mm-hmm. um, oh, man, that was a, a AHA coach. Shazby? Shazby, mm-hmm. yeah. Who's at UA now, right? Yes, he is. Yeah. He's yeah. head coach, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, man, that's so cool. Yeah, good for him. Hell yep. yeah. God, I remember Bootsy was telling me because I know uh, his daughter I played, um, played under him. For played years. under Shazby, and he was telling me, like, he's like, he was the best. He's like, day one, he'd bring them in, he'd bring all the parents in, and he's like, your job, he's number one, your kid's not going to the NHL. <laughs> okay, so get that out of your head night too. Number two, your job is to bring your kid on time and pick him up on time. <laughs> That's it. Yeah, yep. and that was it. And Josh was like, "Yeah, I just dropped mm-hmm. her off every day and picked right. her up on time, and that was it." Because mm-hmm. you know, we got into before we got recording on yep. how this has <laughs> led into uh, you know parents, you know, having a lot of uh, they want to have a lot of influence mm-hmm. on you know if their kid plays and and so much politics that goes that goes into that that hockey you know, growing up hockey and what team you're playing for and what coach you're playing for. and Well, that's exactly why it's become so watered down. Mm. That's exactly why. Good word. You know, you've had a lot of parents uh, over the years that, uh, you know, got a little righteous or, you know, if that's the right word, and went and started their own thing. Um, I won't say names, but, you know, you had the All-Stars and the North Stars, and you had the Bulldogs, and uh, the Bulldog kids wanted to get on the North Star and All-Star teams. Uh, you had the all-star teams and North star teams, you know, cutting the fat every year, if you will, you know, um, mm-hmm. and I, I, I actually forgot about the Mustangs. Um, oh, yeah. that's right. Mm-hmm. That yeah. was another, that was another team that was in line with the Bulldogs where you had, uh, you know, some of these coaches picking off some of these better players in the Valley 
and mm. uh, Eagle River, and then it got bigger. It, it went to Kenai, and then it went to Fairbanks. Mm. Um, and, you know, people, I think, probably felt boxed out a little bit or, or whatever, and, you know, after years of, uh, you know, training for these teams, and then you had the South, South Central Wolves. That's mm-hmm. right, the Wolves, yeah. Yeah, the mm-hmm. South Central Wolves, and then you had um, the Glacier Bears real quick for a minute. Um, then you saw the Boys and Girls Club kind of go away. Uh, and then you saw Matt Sue have two teams, two comp teams. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then you saw Fairbanks eventually had two comp teams. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Yeah. Where it used to be one team in the Valley, one team in the River, one team in Kenai, mm-hmm. you know, uh, and so on. And uh, that all changed. You know, a lot more money got involved and uh, people found a way to, uh, you know, get their kids on the team they wanted to be on. Yeah. Yeah, and it's not like the kids, <clears throat> like where you grew up in or where you live in this, in town, is like kind of where you played. It, yeah. it doesn't work like that anymore. Yeah. It's the kids from all over are all in all different associations now. Yeah, I mean, hell, Kennedy's team has a, a really awesome uh, player from Juno. She she doesn't get to play with them constantly and practice with them constantly. Yeah, but she is on the roster and she comes for tournaments and. And she's awesome, but I thought that was like what a commitment. Oh yeah, from the parents and the player to travel from Juno, which is not terribly far. It's you know two hour flight or whatever, but that's pretty. That's a big commitment. It's pretty intense commitment mm-hmm. to to get up here and you know your kids on a team in Anchorage and you live in Juno, you know. Yeah, yeah. and unfortunately, there's less of those parents that are able to make that commitment. Right, and I'm sure we'll talk about that. Just how complicated things get, but mm-hmm. it's it's far less the amount of parents that we have that can actually uh, sacrifice enough to, to do that, mm. and so we have you know less kids playing hockey. Yeah, yeah. well, it's also uh, like in my case, um, man, you got to be willing to give up your entire winter, your entire weekend. Yeah. Like mm-hmm. in families that are into other things outdoors, whether it's skiing or snowboarding mm-hmm. or. Really snow machine in or anything like that like if you got your kid in hockey like i have lots of friends that have their kids in hockey like i don't even ask them if they want to do something on the weekend because no. they can't because they got 18 games to go to and you got two yeah. kids or three kids it's like mm-hmm. you, you just live, live in the, the rink, rink. Like, yeah. just live there yeah mm-hmm. i want to stay on this track because it's really important to me yeah um because this is all that ever mattered and it's the bigger reason why i'm you know, lucky enough to be with you guys here and, and have you guys think that I'm worthy of sitting here with a conversation. But Josh Boots, um, someone that I grew up with, you know, underneath at East High and just this uh, larger than life, badass, just had the look. I mean, we know what, we know what look he had. Oh, just, yeah. just the eyes and just the ferocity, you know, played football and, uh, you know, being one of my first examples of just real intensity. Mm-hmm. and a presence uh-huh you know there was others you know josh kern and, and, and yeah. things like that um but here i was and remember i want to stay on track with what we were going there mm-hmm. but i just want to talk about parenting yeah mm. um and shazby and, and, and whatnot and shazby was really good uh to the boots family anisa played with that team mm-hmm. longer than i mean at this point we're talking about girls playing hockey longer than most girls get to play competitive hockey at that level because shazby had the team oh mm-hmm. yeah um but we had this day camp in South Anchorage, and we had this game called Body Glove, where the game was all about possession of the balls. And, um, you know, if you had possession of the balls, then you could be on attack. And obviously, you know, we're talking about a kid's game, and you, you can't lose. Yeah. You know, and it's obviously painful for people to lose. Yeah. You know, yeah, and the whole yeah. thing. <laughs> and, yeah. um, it hurts. But, you know, it's, it's fun for the kids. And uh, like the other boys, she stored the ball between her legs and squeezed it to hold on to possession of the ball, you know, for her team. Yeah. You know, she, I mean, she wasn't, like, taking a back seat to nobody. I mean, she was just as uh, intense and effective as any of but any other uh, kid out there. And here I am, you know, just so prideful and happy to have my friend's daughter in the camp and have her be, like, you know, a kick-ass girl hockey player. And... um so obviously I want to be protective and I want my friend to know I got his back and I care about his own and, and whatnot. And uh, this really is a story that needs to be told. I, I swear to God, cause it's like not at all what I was uh, anticipating as far as, you know, 
where it was going. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you'll, you'll understand what I mean. So this little boy was digging at the ball, you know, trying to get the ball between her, you know, between her legs and, and whatnot. And so it was a little sensitive and, and, uh, you know, you know, you're, you're 12, 13, 14, and that's your first, um, uh, introduction to like, you know, we're, we're playing for keeps here. Like this is getting physical, like yeah. you know, we're competing. And, um, so she got a little emotional and it's not a slight to her. I mean, mm -hmm. this, this is new. Like, you know what I mean? We're coming out of girls hockey, blah, blah, blah. And here I am, you know, and Josh just happened to be there that day, you know, um, not as a helicopter parent. Um, you guys know what I mean by that. Yeah. Parents. Yeah, yeah. He, yeah. And he never you is know, like I, that. A lot of great parents, you know, they got jobs where they can just go sit at the rink and watch what the coach is doing. You know, how, how, you know, how, how, uh, how analytic and how efficient are they at running the, the ice times? Yeah. What am I paying <laughs> for here? <laughs> like, how is, you know, we've got the clock watch going, the stopwatch going and you know, how, you know, how, how many times did my kid touch the puck and blah, 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 which I get, I get it. Um, um, so we're in that little, uh, bathroom area at uh, get air mm -hmm. between the sport courts and uh have i ever told you the story jack no okay no i never heard this either i got my track suit on i'm all hockey hockey camped up like this is like this this for me is a world series like this is how i'm gonna you know support myself for the whole summer is, is working these camps yeah and so having people have bad experiences and it's bad for business etc you know is, is, is not helping and and like i and i care I really do care. You know what I mean? It showed, man. I just, to have, see kids get upset, because I remember what it was like for me, it's all I cared about. All I cared about. So here's Anissa crying, and she's a beautiful, cute, sweet um, girl, and Josh is there, you know, 6'3", you know, maybe, let's say 20, 30 pounds <laughs> overweight. Then, I don't know. <laughs> 220, dog. 220. But he, 220, yeah, yeah, but, he, yeah. but, he but he carries it well. Yeah, he does. He, he sure carries does, it well. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. He can still move it. <laughs> And uh, He'd appreciate that, he's man. standing there. No, he, he should because, like, it's true. Like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Julio, he, Papa. Yeah. So he's like, Anissa, what's wrong? And I'm just like, I'm just ready to chime in. Like, yeah, Josh, that kid's done. He's in camp. He's he's in timeout. I'm gonna talk to his parents. You know, the whole <laughs> thing. I, got this. Like, I just I just can't even believe this even happened. Like, oh my god, Anissa's crying. Like, you know, or, or upset, or or you know, she wasn't you know uh, hysterical or anything. Yeah. She was mm -hmm. emotional. You know, so I, I don't want to over overstate that or over dramatize that. And then he says, "Anissa, didn't we didn't we talk about this?" And I'm like, well, "What's he talking about?" And she goes, "Yeah." And I go, "I'm listening." Sorry, I don't. Know. I go nothing. He goes, "Didn't we talk about us like to play with the boys?" And she goes, "She goes, yeah. Like the boys play a little rougher, don't they?" She said, yeah. She said, what's, so what's the problem then? And I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I was like, man, just witnessing a good friend of mine that's someone I just intensely uh, admired or, you know, uh, respected, you know, just not trying to throw his kid the sympathy card or uh -huh. whatnot mm -hmm. or like you know the easy uh, pass because i've definitely dealt with that where you know parents are in your face and the, and he was just like what are we talking about right now you know what i mean you wanted to show up you wanted to compete and this is what happens you know so what are we talking about so i just really want to tell that story where as opposed to you know you're the game is over and you're trying to exit whether it's tryouts or whatever and you know you get parents that come at you with some things that are just not realistic from from your vantage point. Yeah. And because of their love for their child, obviously, um, they're just not completely aware of the reality of, uh, of, 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 you know, but the circumstances where, where things are. stack up yeah. and, and what's maybe best for their kid. Yeah. And, 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 and that's, that's, that's really the thing of, of, of all of this, you know, you go to Minnesota and at some programs, parents aren't even allowed in the rink for tryouts. So, uh, sorry, I went on a, a diversion, but I just really want to tell a story about Josh. I know he's dear to all of us. Yeah, and that was uh, an example of parenting that I just I'll never forget. That's awesome. Never forget. Yeah, yeah, that was great. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's true. I mean, and and she had the uh, <clears throat> ability to actually play co-ed for a long time. She did way beyond what most girls get to play. Mm -hmm. I mean, usually you hit that like twelve, four. 
13, 14 year old mark, mm -hmm. and and girls kind of transfer over to pure girls hockey. Yeah. No, no co ed, but if you play at a high enough level, yep. you can still mix it up in the in the hitting uh, ages and bantams and all that. And yeah, yeah, it's actually kind of rare to see. Yep, very rare. And, and I think uh, once you get to a point to where you're not wanting the puck mm. all the time, then, then it's then it's a situation. You know, boy or girl. Yeah, mm. boy mm. or girl. Um, Is that like the change? I yeah. think once once you, once people are real, you know, kind of got their, because it happens different for everybody, you know, mm -hmm. that physical confidence, and, and, and some kids are a little more aggressive than others. Um, you know, I somebody I want to talk about later in the show because I want to I want to pay tribute to his dad is, is Jay Steagle, but um, mm. you know, some kids just want it more than others, and so it comes across as being rough or, or mm -hmm. over aggressive, um, you know. At a certain time, that was it was it was uh, um, praised, praised. Yeah, and it was it was uh, you know that whole thing, and, and now it's like oh, you know that's that was a little too rough, and you know I can't believe this, and you know, there's the outrage in the stands, and the refs are feeling it, and they're calling the penalties, and before you know it, you got kids now that are you know two or three years out from actual physical body contact that are still you know just hesitant about being in a stick battle, mm -hmm. so. Um, you know, I think that, you know, and obviously we won't go into it too much tonight, but just that whole part about things being objective, mm. um, it's just nowhere near what it used to be. And so, you know, we have what we have. Yeah. Um, it's not awful. It's not the end of the world, but, um, you know, it, it's affected the sport yeah. for sure up here. It's kind Are of we, the evolution of it, I think. Yeah. Are we seeing that nationwide? Yes. Okay. Yes. How about in Canada? Um, we're seeing it. Everywhere in Canada is a little different because in Canada, a lot of people don't realize it's a government. It's government subsidized. Ah, mm -hmm. so in a lot of these smaller communities, the government actually pitches in. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like mm -hmm. you know that little rink in Flin Flon, Alberta. You know, it's not dependent upon all the parents paying for ice times. Right. You know, mm -hmm. the government subsidizes that, and they actually for you, Daniel. You know, if you talk about you know party next door. You know, not so much Drake, but some of the people that came after Drake mm -hmm. is they directly benefited from those. Uh, Canada had some unique entertainment and art grants yeah. and things that they did for a lot of up and coming arts where it was things were subsidized. You didn't have to, you know, have someone foot the bill for that crazy studio time. Yeah. That they do in the States. But, um, well, even ice time, like if they're subsidizing the ice and all that stuff, because yeah. to put your kid in hockey is not cheap. Nope. You know what I'm saying? It's nope. and a big shout out to like Gomez Foundation and all these other um, organizations that are providing you know funds for students and Title One kids and mm -hmm. you know low income students to go and actually and go out there and try and skate, yep. you know, and get after yep. it, which is amazing. And if we had more of those rinks that were you know subsidized like Canada, then the times would be better. <laughs> you know, there wouldn't be as much of like this crazy pull against the family to have your kid in hockey. Where it's like, man, I'm, you know, running the rink at five in the morning and I'm there until 10 o'clock at night type stuff, you know. And the business of it's got out of hand, too, because, you know, you have the rinks that are, you know, municipal rinks, right. MC and Bamboki, and then you got the private rink right. like uh, Subway. And then you got really good people fighting for the same thing, you know, AHA mm. with Barrett and Merritt with uh, South Anchorage and things like that. And they all want the same thing. They have, you know, some different hurdles or, or whatnot, but, um, you know, you got adult hockey. Yeah. It's a thing. It's a big money maker. Yeah. Right. And uh, then, then you've got people's lifestyles, you know, like, you know, they want to ski. They want to be well balanced. They want to, you know, have their weekends and, you know, um, you know, you got your primetime hours and things like that. And it's become a major fight. It's become a, a, a thing of, of who has it and who doesn't. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we don't get, this is another thing that, you know, I'd love to talk about forever, but you, know, you talk about the early nineties and you talk about Scott Gomez and you talk about BJ Young and you talk about Joey Hope and Chris Fournier and, and, you know, guys like Mike Lee, um, you know, they were on, they came from a certain side of town, yeah. you know, <laughs> and yeah. these were the most talented, best hockey players in town. Now, that's not to say there's plenty of guys in West Anchorage and, and South Anchorage that were great hockey players, too. But that's completely changed now yeah. because there's not that same access. 
And uh, oh, that's a great point. You know, we and that's that whole thing about the socioeconomic thing. Like, you know, certain kids, like all they've got is their is, is their sports. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, and that's changed. A lot of those kids that would love to compete if they had the chance and had the right yeah. um, vehicle. You know, whether it be parents that can support it, and you know, other people through the school, or you know friends parents and dads because for me that was huge i had a lot of friends that i played with whose dads took an interest in and took stock in me mm. you know and uh without that yeah, who knows we're gonna be less yeah, yeah. you know mm-hmm. and, uh, that's what's happened was it always hockey once you laced them up and started going or was it like most kids who are you're into baseball and soccer and everything depending on the season it was hockey and then it was when you start playing hockey, Daniel, like you know, like you know, kids playing soccer, and all of the kids that played the soccer team played hockey. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. there was a few kids that played hockey and soccer, and so that's how I got into playing soccer. Yeah, and uh, that's how I got tight with Corbin Schmidt. Yeah, and uh, obviously we we all know about his dad, Craig, and, mm-hmm. and uh, his, his uh, sisters and whatnot, and obviously what Cricket Schmidt did for a lot of us is you know, oh man, you know, rough what a necks. beautiful lady she yeah. was. And uh, she changed a grade for me once, dude. So I could make the team mm-hmm. straight up. Dude. She was okay. This is how fucking stupid I was. I was in Spanish. Um, my first language is Spanish, and I was in Spanish class. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Because I wanted to be in her class. Yep. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And so here comes like get out of a 2.0. Yeah. And for some reason, I was like needed one like C to go to a B, and she was the only teacher that I could be like, Ms. Schmidt. Mm-hmm. oh man I, i'm not gonna be able to play soccer she's like why you know she was super involved mm-hmm. with it and you know and corbin i think was a freshman yep and uh she's like well let me let me see let me see and she like digs through her like thing like randomly mm-hmm. looking through her thing she's like oh well look right here looks like you 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 turned this in and i didn't mark <laughs> it down and it looks like now you have a b and i got uh, to play dude because of awesome. her dude yeah and that is not crooked that is not corrupt there is nothing wrong with that. No. Um, she, she knew it's what I needed. She dude. knew you. Yeah. She knew who you are. She knew your father. Mm-hmm. She knew what you wanted. She knew your character. And uh, without that, like, where where would you be? You know? Yeah. Like, can you imagine? Yeah, man. Had, had she taken that away from you? And who, who knows what would have happened? Yeah. You know? Um, Love that woman. Yeah, man. She I, was I great. Love, a beautiful family. Yeah. Was she like a, a kind of lead dog of the soccer kind of um she was like the mom of the school dude Mm -hmm. she was just she was like but she was really big into soccer because obviously her family was in her daughters and corbin and and her husband were all into soccer and the name is familiar and uh and she was like the mom of the school you know like she was like you could come and tell her your problems you could tell Mm. her about your mom did this or whatever but she would always be hard with you too like well you need to do this you need to do that you need to show Mm. up like Mm. and so she was like hold you accountable yeah hold you accountable Mm -hmm. but you could still talk to her you yeah. know, which was beautiful. What and a lot of times in high school, you know, it's awkward. Mm-hmm. You know, as you're growing oh, up and you don't have do. many adults, you can't really go to your parents to talk about certain mm-hmm. things. And she was just someone that her door was always open, yeah. and you could go talk to her. You know, yeah. and there's probably only a handful of those. Oh. You know, in the school. Yeah, I'll try not to get emotional, but um, she uh, she really was that person that you could go to. Mm-hmm. You know, um, you know, she wrote checks for me. You know, um, you know, I went through some some stuff my junior year where I wasn't on the team, so to speak. And I was looking at the play for Pete McEnany and, and the whole thing out there in Eagle River and, and play against Larky's All Stars with Chris Check and Cusack and Pitta's North Stars with her son. Mm-hmm. You know, so she's writing a check for me to play hockey against her son and um, keeping an eye on me. And like you said, she had that way of looking at you through those little glasses, like, mm-hmm. well, you're not really kind of meeting up to you know my expectations you're and, into the bargain yeah and that's something that's really hard to explain is people that have that ability to kind of be like you can do better and you know you need to do better and uh you know that care about you and that's always my thing is is, is when you people that care about you man god i mean jesus yeah and that proves that it just takes one whether it's a teacher or a coach mm-hmm. that um you know makes you think about actually you know what it's not everything against you Mm -hmm. maybe you should be accountable for some of the some of your actions you know a lot of times it just takes the right person to tell Mm -hmm. you that you're like 
you're right. You know what I'm saying? You don't get angry about it or, uh, you know, yeah. whatever, dad. Or, and she didn't know. live She didn't live in a little house in Airport Heights. She lived in a big old nice house off Cange on South Anchorage and yeah. was commuting every day to teach us in East Anchorage. So, you know, I just want to point that out. Um, but, uh, yeah, God bless her. Oh, God bless her for sure. Um, let's get back for to sure. the start of the hockey. Do you remember the first time you had to drop the gloves on a game? Um, I played you know what in a very i think uh pretty unique time where uh you know here in anchorage you had some some black guys skating uh mike lee matt whitehurst uh ross ships uh, jamal mason oh mason and uh oh man i went to school with his little brother man yep that dude was a bulldog yeah Holy shit. God, I, remember I think he did play for the Bulldogs, too. He did. And I, I remember. <laughs> yeah, he's our, one of like the first black hockey players I kind of knew of. Yeah. Because he was Bartlett, right? And yeah. he had yeah. some beautiful parents, man. Yeah. Beautiful did, parents. Dude. Like, I remember being in a hockey camp, and he carried around his Wayne Gretzky Easton aluminum shaft all day. <laughs> <laughs> all day. I don't know if you guys can remember, but that first Wayne Gretzky edition Easton aluminum was shiny silver uh-huh and it was like a hundred dollars at champion's choice that was and the money, one huh? you know where you put the replaceable <clears throat> blades in mm-hmm. oh and he, gotcha and he carried that stick off the ice in a locker room to lunch <laughs> to the basketball court to kickball <laughs> back to the locker room <laughs> on the ice and i remember you know he may have laid it down when his mom and dad had come to get, and it's just, you know, I'm right there. And they said, Jamal, where's your stick? <laughs> <laughs> and I was didn't just stolen, like, did it? didn't I tell you to hold on to that stick the whole time? <laughs> didn't I tell you to hold on to that stick? And, and uh, man, uh-huh. you know. Um, but I, I, uh, I got a chance to play, you know, um, and, you know, the people that my mom worked for, you know, invested in it and, and, and kept me in it. And it was all I cared about. Yeah. It was all I cared about. And, uh, you know, you go to the rink and you see the older guys skating. Jamal, Brian Swanson, Mike Victor, the Kowals, Bowman, you know, uh, and obviously Scott Gomez. And, and uh, man, you just was like, you, you, I was in awe. I was in awe. I, 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 don't, I don't know what gave me that kind of humility or honesty. You know, maybe it was because, you know, you know, I came from kind of a split family thing going on. And maybe mm. I wasn't feeling like, hey, I'm a prince or whatever. I, I don't know. Yeah. But I just completely was enamored with playing hockey and anything that was involved in it. I wanted to be a part of it. You know, street hockey, you know, Sports Channel America, you know, Wayne Gretzky, the whole thing. And... um I just uh, that 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 was uh, that was all that existed, man. Was just playing hockey and never thinking I was the best, but that's what I wanted to do. Yeah, Mm -hmm. you know. And uh, we'll talk about it later, I'm sure. But you know, you don't want to get left behind. Yeah, you know. Got to work hard. You got to work hard. And and, uh, before we got on air, we talked about you know the coaches kind of having the power and things being a little more objective and and uh, you know things being a little more even in terms mm. of, uh, you know, backgrounds and, and, and it, and it produced what we, what we know of today as, as, uh, you know, the, uh, the nucleus of what our best hockey, Alaska hockey players look like. Yeah. You know, Brian Swanson, Scott Gomez, you know, you know, Brenda Bensky and, and, uh, you know, Nate Thompson, Matt Carl and Tim Wallace, Joey Crabb. I mean, I, I go on and, and then, uh, yeah, it was, it, w- it was a thing, man. Like, even though these guys were all peers, you know, I'm their age group, and we all played soccer and hung out and did all the things that kids do. But then when it was, like, hockey time, you are like, man, these dudes are, like, mm-hmm. at, like, just an aura. Yeah. Just, like, these guys are, like, an aura, and you would just want to, like, normally you're a kid, you don't care. You're just going to do your own thing. Yeah. But you're like, oh, man, these guys are going to go skate, dude. Oh, we're yeah. going to go watch these guys play. Oh, they get on planes. Oh yeah! <laughs> I remember when I realized that they get on planes, airplanes, and they fly places to go play. 
people are going to say, oh, JJ, you clown or whatever. But <laughs> nine, ten years old, like when you looked at those all-star teams, those all-star teams, and you knew that they went to Chicago, they went to Detroit, they went to uh, Calgary, and you're just like, they get on planes and they go play hockey. Yeah. It's got right, to be a huge been. deal. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. And you back know. then, like, you know, we were all poor. And we didn't. I'd yeah. probably never been on a plane yeah. yet. Yep. Yeah, you know? most of us, yeah. <laughs> These guys are going flying around to play hockey, or, and we haven't even, like, gone on a vacation or nothing. Yeah. That's crazy. Yep. You started the question on the fight, though. Uh, I was going to circle oh. back on it. Oh. Um, you remember the first first? <clears throat> I'm really, I'm sorry, and you guys got to keep checking me. Oh, we will. I, I start, oh, that's I, I start good. going in. I get a little too sensitive. And you want poke checks? <laughs> <laughs> a little cross check in the back. <laughs> Go grab that stick in the corner over there. I don't know, man. JJ <laughs> walked in and I was like, damn, well, he's almost as wide as the fucking doorway. Yeah. That dude is <laughs> fucking stout. We'll let Brandon <laughs> poke check JJ. <laughs> you, know, you know what it was? I, was, I don't I was know if I want a piece of that. That was a run. I really was. Yeah, I was a runt. So was you I. know, some of our best friends that we know of, you know, guys that we might think would be a little, well, probably wouldn't, whatever now, but back then to me were, you know, a big deal. It could hold me down on the ground and tap on my tap on my chest and yeah. tap out. Yeah, and I hated that. I hated that. Mm. I was five foot three, hundred and fifteen pounds, and I was a freshman. Mm. And uh, tiny little dude, you know, you got to a point to where it wasn't easy to make the teams, and that was kind of when you know I recognized that my parents were only a part of the in crowd, you know what I mean, and nobody cared whether they made, made the team or not. And you know, it wasn't Scott Gomez, you know, where you could be somebody from the East Anchorage where you know your talents really had to be respected. I just wasn't that good, yeah, compared to my peers, so it was probably easy to to pass on, and uh, made me angry. And it's tough to, to it's tough to articulate to people now, um, but for me, I, it was it was I was angry, I was hurt, mm. um, you know, and and it really kind of rooted. It, it really came to a head my sophomore year where um, I was not on a hockey team. I uh, went to the Bulldogs tryouts and they wouldn't even pick me up, you know, because by then they kind of had their crew. And, yeah, uh, yeah, they were adding maybe two or three guys yeah. every season tops, right? And they had their team. And, uh, you know, at that point, I was a cast-off. You know, didn't make the All-Star team, didn't make the North Star team. And, and uh, you know, as mad as I wanted to be, it didn't translate into anything positive on the ice that would have made a difference. Yeah. And that's kind of, like, hard to hard to uh, admit. Mm-hmm. You mm. know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like It no didn't do anything for you. No matter how hard I tried, I was not, I was not Chris Fournier. I wasn't uh, a Scott Gomez, and I, I didn't have that kind of ability to where, you know, I could transcend that, that lack of, uh, you know, physical speed or power or prowess. Um, but I'd had a relationship with some people in Fairbanks, and they had some hard-ass coach. And, uh, you know, by November, maybe early November, they'd kicked a few kids off the team. Uh, you know, Fairbanks is a different beast. I mean, I'm sure you guys have heard the stories now just in terms of kids oh, skipping yeah. school and it's cold, dark up there. And, and, you know, there's the teen pregnancy and drug abuse and, and whatnot. And uh, that all factored into this particular situation where, you know, they had a really nice team. You know, any of these, these smaller community teams had great tier two teams. And, uh, you know, once you got to midget A's, that was a thing. Now it's U16s, but back then it was like the U18, AAA mm -hmm. team. That was the team you had to be on. Um, and for most, it took time. Unless you were one of those special uh, talents, like you had to wait your turn to play on those, those U18, 18A teams. Mm. So uh, to play in a U18 midget B team wasn't a slap in the face. Um, and they actually had a really nice team. And they had some kids quit. Um my buddy's mom was kind of all in, and, and uh, you know they checked on me because you know her son and I got got along really well in you know, Minnesota. <laughs> you know we just kind of end up palling around the whole time on the trip, and so they were coming down, and obviously they they had called and said, "Hey, we're coming down to Anchorage. Mm -hmm. and we want to get with you and your mother and hang out." You know, you and my son had such a great time, and I was like, "Actually, Mrs. Stewart, I, I I'm not on a hockey team," and they're just like, "Wow," and uh, you know this is probably my first experience into depression. You know, um, oh, it you know, affected you like that, huh? Yeah, you know, it, I just felt like I was no longer good enough to kind of power my buddies in the student center at East High, and so mm -hmm. I went class to class and took my ridicule in between, you know, from Jay and you know, and these, these are my friends, you know, Guilty yeah. Hardy and whatnot. You know, I knew they loved me, but I just kind of wasn't a part of that thing then. You know, I wasn't uh, socially advanced or whatever, and I was hurting because and and I didn't feel like I was 
good enough to hang out, you know. So I just went class to class to lunch, ate my lunch to the next class or whatever. And uh, the, their Fairbanks team came down. They said uh, we're short players. I, I think they only had like ten skaters. So I dressed up, suited up, played with them for the weekend. And I remember on Sunday, you know, we're getting ready to go to Village Inn. Oh yeah. Oh, you know, right. have some uh, Belgian waffles with some mm-hmm. strawberries and whipped cream on it. Oh, that's right. <laughs> the, no- the Northern Lights location? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and the non-smoking <coughs> section. Yep. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's right, dude. And uh, I remember, um, you know, finishing my bagel and whatnot and got out to the parking lot, and there was this coach. You know, Fairbanks has a network back to Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, and that's where this guy came from, Mike Stanford or, or uh, Kurt Sanford. I know it's not some Sanford. You know, and he had that, you know, early onset of alcoholism, you know, where you, the red veins. But, you oh, know, yeah. we don't know that as kids, but mm-hmm. yeah. you know, it was hardcore dude. Face. And I understand mm-hmm. now, like, Fairbanks, well, Jesus, wow, living up there. And uh, he said, we want you to come live with Shirley and, and play on the team. And, you know, move to Fairbanks. And lucky for me, my mom was uh, willing and went to West Valley for a semester and went to uh, weight training every day. And I just thought about, like, you know what, when I get back, I'm going to be good enough. Mm-hmm. You know? Mm-hmm. You know, skating outside at you know outside the dipper, and I'm gonna surprise these guys. Yep, I'm stick yelling to Wu Tang Clan. You know, mm-hmm. in, in the in the in the, uh, in the garage. You know, playing the uh, beatbox with the disc player, and and I was just obsessed with like, all right, it's gonna be different when I get back. And uh, you know, it was uh, thankfully, and um, I think that's where it started. Yeah, uh, the physical confidence. You know, uh, coming back, skating with the guys and, you know, my friends being my friends are happy to see me when I came back in March and April when this hockey season was over. And we do the UAA skates where, you know, Larky kind of had his thing where everybody would skate together. And then obviously, you know, the team in that translation, the Bethard skates where, you know, it was the big time guys, the former pros. And like, if you weren't good enough, you definitely didn't get to skate. Yeah. And they were called the Bethard skates. I don't know why, because uh, I don't remember them being there, but. Be- Bethard? Bethard. 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 Yeah. Bethard Brothers. Yeah, they skated. They skated. They had, I had a skate at UA in the, uh, uh, in the summertime on the weekdays. And uh, as a junior, I played for Pete McEnany, and, and he uh, just was the first coach that was like, after adolescence, you know, through puberty, was just like, no, you're good. I want you. Like, yeah. I, I'm going to play you. And um, you had bulked up a little bit by I, then, I, too. I had bulked up. I was I was I was angry and I and I hate to kind of reuse that word. I was mad and, and uh at that point I'd been picked over several times by a lot of kids that, you know, I, I just kinda of refused to think were were, you know, better than me, I guess. And um back then you had Pitt had a North Star team, Larky had the all star team and Mackey had or uh, McEnany had the uh midget team. And all three teams were solid. Mm. And all three teams back then would go to regionals and kind of battle it out and uh you know we'd all be kind of in the mix obviously the all-star team was the preeminent you know i had the cusacks and the chris chucks and the smiths and the ryan youngs and Corey carlson's and they had uh, the squad they had the, they had the squad and so they would kind of you know seize the, <coughs> daniel hacker joey hope you know they'd kind of you know seize the day and um here i was kind of trying to uh reassert my value to the group my social group so I'm getting back to the question you asked. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not a punk kind of thing. Yeah. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm, you know, I'm kind of right underneath Mike Lee's wingspan here, you know. You know, to me and, and to most of us, I would think Mike was larger than life, really. Oh, yeah, um, dude. Well, of course. I mean, he was a legit bad, bad mofo. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 15, 16, 17. And those are the guys I ran with. Mm-hmm. Mike Lee, Jason Krischuk, Casey Cusack, Joey Hope, you know what I mean? Jay Stegall, Scott Gomez, Barrett Heiston, um, you know, just you name it. And I hate that if I'm missing anybody. But uh, I felt like I had to prove my... Um, Your worth? My worth to, to my little social group. So whether that was on the ice, you know, someone called me a whatever P word or whatever... I'll be out in the parking lot, you know, mm-hmm. catch up to him. I catch up to him at a party, like, you know, or <laughs> you know, you know, Jer- Jay Jay Christchuk as we, uh, you know, know, knew him for a while was Wormy. Mm-hmm. You know, you just uh, <laughs> I didn't give him that name. Barrett and those Diamond guys gave him that name. 
um, <laughs> just because he just somehow found a way to kind of infiltrate, you know, the whole diamond scene and, and some of their uh, whatever. Um, and so I found myself, I found myself kind of uh, taking off for Mike's lead, you know, because at that point Mike Lee had got left to play for Team USA, mm -hmm. and so now mm -hmm. I was, you know, my friend's protector. Yeah. And it, you know, I, I was still in that mindset where I wanted to prove myself to, to my buddies and, and, uh, uh, as juvenile as you want to think, I mean, it, that's what it really was, you know, when and where can I step up, you know, yeah. uh, through that fear? Cause trust me, I, I was afraid, you know, I was never like, Oh, I'm the, you know, yeah. And I wasn't six foot five, 245 pounds, you know, um, so through those experiences and doing those uh, Lakeland skates and the uh, Sorensen Showcase skates, you know, you had those junior teams come in to uh, scout and evaluate the local talent or whatever. And then you got to kind of deal with some uh, s some grudges, mm. if you know what I mean. Yeah. Oh. And that's where it like started. Like a history of that's tryouts. That's and where it started, you know. Um, I'm sure we're all aware of Dana Ferguson. Mm -hmm. Love him. Uh, I shouldn't say I love him. He's not like my, my buddy or anything, but he's somebody I grew up with. So obviously, you know, affectionately, he's part of our group. But I remember that was a that was a real grudge I had because he was a part of that bulldog, you know, oh. South Central thing, and he was mm -hmm. really yappy. You know, and here I was thinking, like, <coughs> how dare this guy think that he's going to yap me? Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? As soon as so we got the chance to do these uh, showcases in the spring, where we could duke it out. I mean, I don't know if you remember. Do you remember this? No, I don't. Yeah, Sorensen Showcase in Lakeland. So Rick Trupp would run Lakeland, and Sorensen would run the Sorensen Showcase. And there'd be college and junior teams from all over North America that would come and evaluate Anchorage talent. Mm -hmm. And it was junior rules. You hired, oh. you hired some, some, whatever, some guy to come drop the puck or whatever, blow the whistle, and you got to fight. And that's where it started. That is honestly where I started. And Dane Ferguson was my first target. And I couldn't wait. Oh, you know, man, just been I mean, holding it in. I mean, if you know Dane, if you know Dana Ferguson, I mean, I haven't been around the guy for 20 years now, but just a ornery, <laughs> you know, just loudmouth dude, you know what I mean, full of spunk and feisty. And that was my first target. And, I, you know, I, I, I gave it to him. You know what I mean? <laughs> and, and that was the first time I had uh, somebody ever talk to me, come back to mention, like, oh, I like that. Like, hey, handle yourself, son. Oh. And I was like, wow, that's what it takes to get some uh, recognition. Now, honestly, I didn't fancy myself like, oh, I'm the goon or whatever, but that was just a, a stepping stone to stepping up. Yeah. You know? It was a confidence builder uh, yeah. builder for you, yeah. right? Yeah. Yep. And uh, that was what, 17? 17 years old, yeah. yeah. You know, and, and I wasn't one of the, the better <coughs> players that come out. So a lot of these guys that were really good, they left as sophomores and juniors. Mm hmm. Um, but for the most part, got a lot of us left after senior year. Mm -hmm. You know, played two or three years and, and uh, got scholarships if they, you know, were fortunate and and uh, moved on to college. And um, what I saw, and I'm sure what you guys all saw, is a lot of these guys that we grew up playing hockey with end up, like, not finishing their commitments. Yeah. Mm, that's true. That was another example of, uh, to me, of, like, am I one of those guys that can't, like, survive? Yeah. So I'm not saying I had the greatest, you know, role model right there in my face every night, but I had enough through my friends and their parents and what I was observing and, and uh, where it was obvious, like, can you handle it or you can't, can you not, you know what I mean? Like you go out in the world, like you get challenged a little bit, you're going to, you know, kind of wilt under that adversity and that kind of sense of competition and uh, swim, if you will, or are you going to kind of oh, come home and finish out UAA or go work for dad or my uncle and whatever. And, uh, that's what it looked like to me. And, mm. uh, I didn't have an uncle to give me a job. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't have a mom and dad that had a job for me. Yeah. There was nothing really waiting for you to fall no, back on. Right. No. And I was coming behind some pretty impressive, you know, uh, peers. Yeah. You know, with Scott and Mike, the bar was set pretty high. Yeah. And, yeah, it was, uh, you know, and, and like, it's just, uh, it was a special time, man. Yeah. It was a special time. That was a great answer to that question. Man. That was awesome. That was <laughs> great. broke down the full history of it. That's and everything. right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I, I think it was just about just kind of stepping up and, 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 and finding your part mm -hmm. of the group. Did that so like develop? Uh, no, go oh, ahead. I was just curious. Did that 
kind of spark and develop maybe part of your style and in, in the footprint on the game of hockey that you kind of left? I, th- I think that it was – I started to learn the um, allegiances and the loyalties that would come to me through being um, a good friend. Mm. Um, so, you know, did you guys ever fish the willow opener? In, oh, in yeah. Willow? Oh, for yeah. kings growing up yeah it used to be unbelievable right? elbow to um, elbow the mud fest you had and, to walk uh, through yeah you know, i'd be out there with uh, in the neck i'd be out there with tj giddens and kyle sellers and michael lee and um and whatnot and you know we we're out there you know with the chris chucks that was the people who invited us you know they, that was a thing for them every year they would uh you know steer off the uh, the campsites for us and then we'd hike back and we'd have our own little campsite on the sandbar probably 20 or 30 minutes away you know, navigate the tree stumps and oh, kind of oh, fall yeah. into the mucky <laughs> silt. Yeah, yeah, there's a word, the primordial ooze of those mm. certain little ponds. Yeah, and uh, you know, when that gun went off at midnight, I mean, it was shoulder to shoulder and fish on. Oh, you know, man. everybody was catching fish. Hogs, and, and you had people cutting people's lines with the with their uh, oh, yeah. lighters <laughs> and whatnot. Oh yeah, and I idolized Bruce Christchuk. You know, I, li- I idolized uh, him and, and uh, just, you know, just the kind of dad he was in the household that he was running with uh, his wife, Diane, and, and their three kids. And uh, just so appreciative of the way Jason had kind of um, brought me in. And, and um, you know, I lived at the house on the weekends. Mm-hmm. You know, I mowed the lawn. Like, oh, that's a joke. And, you know, a lot of my friends make weird, you know, jokes about, you know, Jay's half black, half white friend coming over mowing the lawn every Sunday when they had a perfectly capable teenage son to mow it but <laughs> but it sounds I just, like you were giving back you're doing i your was part. just uh, you yeah, know like mrs uh, chris was feeding me and right? very well yeah you know uh and they 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 uh, you know i i don't know how to describe it but i mean they i was i was loved yeah mm-hmm. you know i was loved like and, part you know, of the family yeah. you know my friends listen to this and be like man they were blah 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 i don't <laughs> want to say because it sounds so derogatory you know it wouldn't be funny on this but you guys know what i mean definitely and just as a way to make fun of me uh, but uh no i just that was anything to be a part of that and uh things that kind of weren't innate or um obvious with my family and that's no sign of my family just things were different mm-hmm. yeah and uh so we would we would uh, go to this fishing opener, and there's Bruce out there. And it, it would always start with Bruce, just like probably your dad or whatever. Like you know, all the friends take a back seat, let dad go out there and mm-hmm. do his thing, and <laughs> and here Bruce is being a badass. Boom! Right away, had a fish on, and he's saying, "Ha! Ah, don't you do it! Don't you do it! Don't you do it! Ah!" And uh, somebody like like people are supposed to pull their lines out, especially yeah. at Willow Creek, if you remember back then. And coming down, line. coming and down. Here he was with all his kids' <laughs> friends. I mean, there was probably twenty of us sitting on that bank behind him, and he—you can only imagine how frustrated he was. Like, boom, lose a fish like that. Everybody's yeah. juiced up, nice. The night just started. Yeah, you know, ah, damn it, Bruce. You know what I mean? That just wasn't, uh, you know, that was not good uh, for him. <laughs> so he stomps down the bank, and then the other faction starts stomping down the bank. I'm like, oh shit, uh, uh, okay. And uh, he's yelling at a kid, and there's an older guy yelling at him too. And uh, I go to kind of get in front of the kid, just like, all right, you know, let the whatever, let the uh, let them sort this out. We'll get back to fishing. Um, and uh, I feel this stumbling behind me, and I turn and I see Bruce staggering, and I looked up and I see this guy with this mustache looking right at me, like what? And I had no idea what happened, but whatever I assumed, it wasn't good. And I just stroked him. Just stroked him. Just, just did. I didn't even hesitate. Just stroked him. <laughs> you know, uh, just something that came over me that was, you know, my dad in a lot of ways. Yeah. You know, socially and a lot of the nuances that we go through as teenagers and whatnot. Or, mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I knew he cared about me and the whole thing. And just, the, you know, here he was Here he was in his moment. You were going to, you know, you were going to do that to him. Yeah, no, That's no, all no. I thought. Without knowing, I didn't hesitate. And the guy went splash in the water in the creek. <laughs> <laughs> and people had to scurry because we know the creek is moving. Oh, yeah, 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 fast. And people had to grab the guy. Yeah. Because <laughs> he was laid out in the uh, water. And I'm just like, oh, my God. 
what I do. What did I just do? Here I was. I had Kyle Sellers, <laughs> Mike Lee, <laughs> period. Nothing is to be said about TJ Giddens, Gatorade Player of the Year. You know, behind me, and here I was, you know, the kind of... They're probably just like, holy shit, you what know, do you just do? This guy comes, he walk, he, he, they pull him out of the water, they get him up, and we're just like, okay, what's going on here? Because we know people are carrying guns down there. Oh, yeah. So oh, it gets are, contentious, People for are sure. coming down the bank. This is 2003, 2002, and uh, the guy sticks his hand out right away, and he goes, God damn it, son, that was a hell of a punch. I was a Marine, <laughs> I've never been hit like that. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, I, that was when I had felt like, okay, I guess I, I'll, 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 I'll lay it on the table, you know, for people I care about. Yeah. And I think from that was like uh, the spawn of a, a lot of it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, people were proud of me. And uh, the funny part of it is for the rest of the night, Bruce Christchuk had 10 feet on the other side of him. <laughs> uh, just all the flipping room he needed right there oh yeah. this is a true story <laughs> Steve McSwain was there he can tell you like oh, it, was that's nuts. Funny. it was shoulder to shoulder willow opener and Bruce Christchuk this guy with this crazy ass mustache you know 1977 haircut just just <laughs> <laughs> flipping up and down the <laughs> this is my bank <laughs> didn't even need the fishing game hat on. <laughs> silver bullets. It was great. <laughs> That's awesome. Let's take one quick second here and give a shout out to uh, some of the great sponsors. Uh, the Treehouse AK, your one-stop dispensary located at 341 Boniface Parkway. Be sure to ask the bud tender about their deal of the day because, honestly, there's always something good on deck. And, guys and girls, listen, this is where the culture lives. At the Treehouse, their dedication to servicing consumers has been developed through a lifetime of involvement in the cannabis culture. They're committed to providing the highest quality products at whatever value your budget affords, while always maintaining the deep-rooted principles that have carried them this far. Their focus is on relationships over transactions, and you can always depend on them to treat you with the respect you deserve. Hit them up at thetreehouseak.com, and remember, you must be 21 years of age to enter their store. Tailored Restoration, 24-hour emergency home services, helping Alaskans restore their dreams since 1972. Services include fire, water, mold, post-emergency cleaning, repair, and remodeling. Tailored has an emergency response number with trained professionals available to help you at any time, day or night. Give them a call in Anchorage, Eagle River, Mad Sioux, or Fairbanks, or hit them up at tailoredrestorationalaska.com. Serrano's Mexican Grill since 2008. Serrano's is Anchorage's own new generation of old cocina. Their menu showcases the passion and love of their rich heritage and unique family recipes that have passed them down, that have been passed down through generations. Serrano's goal is to embrace and display traditional flavors using the best ingredients that are available. They focus on making everything from scratch daily. In-house menu include handcrafted corn tortillas, uh, serrano salsa, carne asada, marinades, and chorizo. But don't take their word for it. Experience the, the tradition and sabor for yourself. Locations on Tudor and Northern Lights. Check out their daily specials at Serrano's Mexican Grill.com. Damn, I thought you were going to bail on me, Jack. Yeah, no, I, I was like, that. I'll just hang out here and wait for everybody to come back. <laughs> yeah, it would not be cool. I was going to ask you, I was like, you know, since everyone else was gone, what other tricks you had to, you know, free up the riverbanks of the crowd? Oh, man. I, you know, I, I've never really embraced, I'll be honest, man. I've never really embraced that, like, super battle shoulder to shoulder fishing. Uh huh. Um, I w grew up fish and trout with my grandfather and my dad. And these aren't like fly fishermen, like artistic, wearing all the Gucci. Double hauling. Yeah, these are like just, you know, white boys from Iowa and, and you know, hip boots from Fred Meyer and yeah. cheap rods and reels. And, you know, like we, it was simple fishing. We didn't catch a lot, but we, yeah. we got out. <clears throat> so, you know, going to Quartz Creek growing up and – um <clears throat> um, you know, Ptarmigan Creek, we'd mm -hmm. hike down from yep. from the, the Seward Highway and we'd yep, go down right. to the mouth and yep. there would be no one. Yep. You know, and, and half the time it was just me and my brother playing with sticks and grandpa and dad were fishing and, you know, we'd maybe throw a rod out there and, you know, a line and maybe hook up a dolly and it was cool. Then I got to high school and 
uh, my best friend Eric Corman, who's also a hockey player, uh, his dad, you know, he grew up kingfishing, mm -hmm. willow, you know, going to the Russian Reds. Yeah. So, so this dude jumped in his dad's Jeep with a six pack of beer, I think like a bowl, and no sleeping bags and we're going to sleep in the back of his Jeep and we go down there and we wake up for the opener and go down there and I'm like, oh, this is going to be fun, man. Like real first badass king fishing trip. And I, th I think I'm like 16 at the time. Mm -hmm. And we get down there and I'm like, what the fuck? Like, I thought we we're coming all the way out here. There wouldn't be, I mean, I saw the cars and I was like, what? I'm like, there's this many people. We get down there and I'm like, holy shit. Yeah. Like, it is like a wall of people. And uh, I tried to get in there, and, you know, the, I think it was, like, this big old dude with a mustache, like, kind of threatened me or said something. I can't remember what he said. It was 20-plus years ago now, and I was just like, man, fuck this. I was, I was, like, coming down here to have fun and fish. And mm -hmm. So I, I don't have an answer so to your question. So you threw rocks in the water? No, actually, you know what I did is I just went up on the bank, and I just chilled and just kind of watched and was yeah. just like, well... You know, if I can get a spot and get in there yeah. and fish, and every once in a great while, you'd get two or three guys that might get a fish all at the same time. And then, you know, at the willow, you would, like, hook one up, and it would kind of, you know, there was back then, those those fish were, you know, it wasn't uncommon to catch a 30, 50 40, yeah. 50 pound fish. Yeah. And a big hog in the in the drift, you know, it ends up, you know, coming down, coming down. Yeah. You get a guy walk down, you kind of slip in there. Mm -hmm. And I remember hooking up a couple times, but it was just always, like, tangling with somebody and mm -hmm. bumping elbows. It was always like, ah, this isn't my, like, jam. Yeah. But I, oh, man, dude, I know there was some glory days. And yeah. there wasn't a lot of people like, oh, good for you. Look at no. that fish. It was like, oh, yeah. It was like, F you. Fuck you and your fish. I want mine. That's it was right. it was you know so I mean? contentious. Yeah, that might have yeah. been the other um, turnoff to me. And and that kind of translated into the, the Russian, which I kind of adopted that a little more because you, you got to go down there with your buddies and your buddy knew a spot that mm -hmm. his dad taught him yeah, yeah. kind of get away from the crowd yeah. you know and still have a good time and yeah but the willow there wasn't a lot of places to go no i mean it was kind of like right there yeah and um yeah it was it was so i don't want to say like toxic or poisonous because I, I wouldn't go that far it was just very contentious yeah. it was intense and, and it's obvious because it got ruined yeah, it clearly got ruined, especially for our age group. Yeah, yeah. like you said, you remember when it was unbelievable. Yeah, it was like just the off. end of it. I yeah. think. I, I think I caught. I like. I, I want to say that might have been two thousand. Yep. Two thousand one, actually. Yep. Now that you say that, and it was only, I think, cracking like that for maybe ten years after that. Yep. And it started to taper. Of course, then the red, excuse me, the king run Dip. also depleted. Yeah, late two thousands. Yeah. yeah, and it just wasn't the fish to supply the the demand of that yep. that. Yeah, Combat it was interesting chaos, how they allowed it. Yeah, the Lau family had a different technique. I was like Mateo, and my obsession as a kid wasn't hockey, it was fishing. Mm -hmm. And my job at those jo those kind of holes was to make sure that everyone had their space. Mm -hmm. So, like, you can fish right next to us, but you're going to fish right, and I'm 10, and I will catch your waders every time until you do. Oh, gotcha. And you so that was my tone. job as, like, the kid. And it was, like, my dad would just taught us how to fish right. Like, most of the time we fished places, like, way off the grid, you know. Mm -hmm. And we hiked in with not all the best shit. Mm -hmm. You know, usually we got our stuff at, you know, garage sales. But we'd sure. get into the good fishing spot, you know, hike in and fish right. Uh, JJ's fished with us before. He knows how we fish. <laughs> but when we went to the crowded spots, like, I knew how a hole should be fished at mm. 10. And I was going to make sure that you didn't wade into the wrong spot or you gave people space. And my dad would wear a fishing game hat. And between oh. those two things, <laughs> we usually had some space. Because, like, who else's kid other than a fishing game officer is going to allow that shit to happen? Right. You know, so we usually had, like, maybe 10 or 12 day. feet on each mm -hmm. side of us, even at Ship Creek. <laughs> There's things like that. Just perfect. It was you know? fun. Yeah. Well, it's a, it's, it's also a, a it's also hat. a learning opportunity because as I take Mateo to the Russian and these places that are busy, like either you're going to step up and get in between these guys mm -hmm. and make some yep. space for yourself mm -hmm. to fish, yep. Yep. or yep. you're going to sit there all day have and some not, courage. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. you're going to have good point. You're going to have build up the courage enough to get in there, yeah. and and get after it. And, yep. and then once they do, then it's like okay, I yep. know what I got to do now. That's right. And then, and a lot of things I'll tell them as we're going. I'll say, listen. 
you've been to this place way more than all these people yes. that have been here. These are tourists. They don't know what they're doing. Yep. You know what you're doing. So you go in there like you know what you're doing because you do. And you take advantage. Yeah, and that's yep. it. And then they'll see him go in and get a fish within like the first five minutes. And then they're just like... Oh, man, there's this kid yep. over here, man, mm -hmm. just getting it. I've been here all day. You know, yep. I haven't got yep. one, and he just got three in, like, yep. an hour. I mean, and always, like, be kind to the people around you at the same time. Like, I yep. mean, if you're catching someone, you're catching them they think by accident, right? Like, yep. I'm being kind to everyone, talking yep. to everyone while I'm doing this. It's not, like, some jerk. Yeah. Well, that's important, too, and I like to communicate with people, too, especially mm -hmm. new people that I know. I was like, oh, you probably need a little bit more weight on there. Yep. Or, you know, if you back up, the fish will come yep. a little bit closer. You're kind of pushing them out everyone back up for yeah. the next quarter of a mile downstream <laughs> everyone take one step back isn't it amazing how much you buy with that you know help people out yeah you know you buy some respect and all of a sudden you know like that whole uh, uneasy tension kind of goes away yeah and they're like, good point we got respect Justin, yeah. and it's just like man like that was so easy to do and everyone and what i got fun. out of it was so great yeah mm -hmm. yeah you know what i mean like yeah just yeah i like yeah, to sit back absolutely. and just observe it for a little bit like look at everyone and be like all right that guy knows what he's doing mm -hmm. these two guys don't i could probably just walk right up in here between these two guys and catch one real quick and then they're gonna look at me and i'm gonna be like oh this is what you need to do mm -hmm. and then they're gonna they're gonna move over that's right you, mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying yeah I'll start giving you some space and because they want now they want a little piece of that yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. there's plenty of room there plenty really of room. is there's plenty of room. oh yeah Yep, yeah, plenty of room. And learning to time that when you're in that busy, like, you know, mm -hmm. if you're on the confluence or something like yeah. that, and just being able to time, like, you know, it's, it's going to work in everyone's favor if we're all flipping mm -hmm. at the yeah. same time. Yeah. You know, getting a rhythm. Yeah. You know, I know who you are. You're out here with your son, your wife, whatever. And, like, we're having a good time. Like, hey, we don't have time for it to be to be jerks, to be assholes. And, mm -hmm. and that's what's unfortunate sometimes is yeah. just to have people just be so kind of. Uh, non um i would say social yeah, yeah. or, or uh, what's that anti-social yeah. they're not doing what's right for them the yeah. best for the group yeah, yeah. we're yeah. Out here for the same thing yeah. yeah um so after you do the high school deal and then you decide juniors yep um is that the bozeman ice dogs that's the Bo that's the bozeman ice dogs it was because i had got montana that's Montana. Mm -hmm. And um, I was in the BC Hockey League, and things weren't kind of going my way. Um, kind of followed Jace and Chris King and Nick Ringstead and uh, Greg Wirtz, uh, quite a few Alaskans. And it was the best team in Canada at that point. So, um, you know, spots were few and far between. Uh, for someone who wasn't coming with a lot of hype, um, you know, you really got to be somebody who's coming with some real Division One kind of uh, perspectives to be someone that's going to be in a lineup or well thought of or, or, you know, on the team. Yeah. And so I ended up having to play between the Junior B team and the Junior A team. And then uh, Phil McKinnon and Corey Allen had kind of got to a spot to where they have these cut down dates. And, and, and unfortunately, they got cut down. And, uh, Bozeman had always kind of been there for us coming out of high school, and uh, it was a good chance for us to all go. And, uh, you know, I think, the co I think the coach cared about me and obviously knew I wasn't, like, you know, loving life playing in uh, Enderby, uh, British Columbia, you know, busing to Revelstoke and Enderby and places that none of you have ever heard of. <laughs> <laughs> uh, playing hockey at people who were, you know, working at the the, the, the pulp mill or whatever and, and were not planning on playing hockey after juniors, where it's, for me that was something that's all I cared about, mm. no slight to them. But I was clearly just not where I wanted to be. So he said, hey, uh, go with Phil and, and uh, Corey. You can stay, and I will continue to call you up and use you. But, you know, uh, I, I really do think this guy was, you know, he, he from outside of Alaska, I think, genuinely cared about me or respected my game and so he let me go to uh, bozeman with with phil and Corey, and i was there with mcgillery mm -hmm. and brian anderson and, and uh, eric robertson and uh, you know got to play every night you know mm. uh, and then bozeman at the time it was a big deal it was brand new in the uh, frontier league or american west league and you know at that point i was like okay i'm gonna play the skill game you know, I'm, I think I'm better than these guys. And, you know, I tried that for a while, but um, you couldn't get away from your natural energy that was, you know what? Like, I'm just not tolerating people sticking me, mm. t 
talking to me a certain way, treating me like I was less than. And when I talk about getting angry, um, I learned that imposing myself changed the entire game for me. Mm. Mm. You know, once I made it clear, like, hey, um, and this goes back to all kinds of things that, you know, this is kind of therapy for me, but, you know, I, I, would, I would say being being with a Mike Lee and, and seeing him be him, you know, for us as teenagers. And I was just like, you know what? Why do I got to take this shit? Yeah. He doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, and uh, it became a thing. You know, I, I had a, rep- I, I earned a reputation for being somebody that was willing to, you know, chase people around the rink. Um, okay, in the game, playing the game as, as far as skill wise, uh, being competitive. And uh, I mean, let's just be honest. Like, when you're playing against someone who's like ready to fight you, um, it changes everything. Yeah. Like, you kind of, uh, I'm not sure I really, I mean, I'm not sure how much, I'm questioning how much I like to play when I'm playing against you, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. and so you know I, what you're getting into. Yeah. And, and I think I thrived <clears throat> off that, Yeah, mm. you know, and then it, it took me from Bozeman to Danville to Omaha, um, where were you there with the young in Omaha? I came after young had been through in Lincoln. Okay. And uh, by then, I had seen a lot of these guys that I grew up with that were kind of more, definitely more highly touted than I was. Mm -hmm. Um, Things kind of happened the way they did, where Mm -hmm. they they didn't really finish or or keep going. And um, I recognized that and and what were the reasons for that. And um, I think it just came down to commitment. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. it was for me that was the only thing I, I didn't see an alter uh, an alternative uh, vehicle towards success and feeling like I belonged and was cool and whatever. Mm-hmm. When I'm trying to be, I'm trying to be there with Mike and I'm trying to be there with Jay and I'm trying to be there with Casey and you know Scott Gumbel was obviously by then you know eons beyond. But mm-hmm. you, you know you wanted to be a part of that hockey thing, yeah. Because um, at that time, you know, in the early you know or the late '90s, 2000s, like it was a thing. You yeah, know, like these guys are doing this. They're playing in the NHL. They're playing at uh, big time Division One hockey schools. You know, Joey Crab. You know, Jason Risner, uh, Brenda Binsky. Um, so, it. Um, how do, how do I find my way? Yeah, to uh, to to do these things too. Um, wasn't as skilled or talented or, or had the resume they did. <coughs> and, uh, you know, that was my vehicle was yeah. to be, I don't want to say a thug or a goon, but I would say ultra competitive. And that become, became my hallmark. Yeah. Where like, he's not going to be your top six for it, but damn, if you got him on the team, it's going to change things for you because yeah. it changes the narrative of the whole game when you have a player out there that's kind of like, hey, like, don't think that you won't get tested. And we all know that that's, that's a real thing when it comes to uh, life having opposition. Yeah, absolutely. And 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 I and I think I learned that. Yeah, that energy and drive. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I hope I'm making sense, but you I, are. I think I was figuring that out. Yeah, I was figuring out that it was uncomfortable for people to recognize, like, hey, this guy is like, you know, yeah. He he's not comfortable just being on the team. I think he he knows that. Like if he doesn't do something, he's not going to have a spot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like it was it was uh, throwing trash in the summers and mowing lawns or whatnot and uh, shoveling gravel and and packing uh, stones for Todd Christensen and and, uh, and I didn't like that. Yeah, you know. Yeah, you have goals. Yeah, yeah. Well, just like any uh, you know young man growing up who's who's trying to find his role in his around his peers and and have these goals that he wants to do and you know what's difficult is to finally come to terms with where you are and what you're actually good at and what your value is you know what i'm saying or like you know hey i'm not going to be the guy that's dangling through everybody and going to score the top cheese goal like that's not me i'm not the overtime guy i probably won't even play in overtime you know what i'm saying but to be able to be humble enough and persistent enough to know that what your role is like that's 
that's that's that's a lot. I think you just said it because at, at that point I had already had several of my friend's parents investing in me. You know, Billy Crumb, uh, Keith Mitchell's dad, Art Mitchell, um, and guy named Mr. McAlpine, Dr. Williams, and if I forget you, I, I really apologize. But then by then I had I had recognized that people had invested in me having opportunities. Mm -hmm. You know, because maybe it made them feel good, or maybe they thought that maybe I was worthy, or whatever. Um, I would never just think I'm worthy or entitled, but um, I wanted to play. Yeah, you well, know, you probably showed a lot of persistence as well that yeah. these people that are mm -hmm. that are um, supporting you, whether it's financially or mm -hmm. emotionally or whatever, they see like when you see someone that really wants it so bad that they're willing to do whatever it takes. Like you want to get behind something mm -hmm. like that, yep. you know, whether it's a young person or it's a business or something like that. That you see that someone is is trying their best and they have these goals, and even though they might not have the entire skill set to to do it, they're still just pushing so hard and they have these other skills and to see that in someone you know and for you to accept that help from them that's a, that's a big step forward yep. you know and that probably is the beginning like you said of, of you realizing like your value and, and building your confidence yeah. and things like that i think it, th that's where the kind of the accountability started and um mm. i'm not going to score all the goals you know that's just not that's just not going to be be me okay what are some things i can control and how can i affect everything and that was just by going balls out you know right. what i mean just hitting the rink running and uh just an energy force just an energy you know uh, that was you know you couldn't ignore it and i had just learned through experiences and 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 hopefully from some positive affirmation and feedback from from my friends and and coaches through getting more opportunities that, you know, th this works. Um, you know, we all want to be a part of something, you know. Uh, through that, you know, some people ascend to leaders and, and become the people that be, are, are followed. But, you know, that we really do want to be a part of something. And that was my way to make sure I was a part of something. Yeah. Mm. Was to just, just give her. Yep. You know what I mean? Yep. And uh, just Impact. not stop. Yep. <laughs> and, and step up. And if somebody challenged me, like, you weren't going to do that in front of people and think that I wasn't going to just, like, shy away, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And you just keep yep. evolving, and, and it becomes a thing where eventually you become something that you're actually known for, which is not anything I'd ever intended. I never played at UAA go to those games watching Mike and Louie and Scott and BJ Young and some of those guys that weren't from here playing for the Aces. I never looked out there and was like, oh, yeah, that's going to be me. Oh. You know, Bob Lester thinking I'm Mr. TNT, right? You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. that was not what I was thinking. Like, I'm going to go be the Aces tough guy. That was not – because at that point it was like, look at Mike, like just, just a great white shark out there just lurking and you could you could feel that the fear of the <laughs> other teams that came up here and i was just like oh i want to be on the aces not as the quote unquote because i didn't see myself that way mm. what happened was is it became a necessity um if i wanted to continue playing that was the need i had to find a way to <laughs> contribute um, contribute and for me that was by getting around the rink 100 miles per hour Punishing their team, stepping up, and um, that's a thing. You know, it, it's a thing to um, be out there against someone who really wants to impose themselves on you, and to be on the rank with someone who felt they can impose themselves on me took me back to being bullied. Mm. And we talk about, you know, when I finally got anger, angry or whatever. That's really how I took it. I didn't take it as, oh, I'm going to be just like Mike Lee, because that's not at all how I thought it was, because he was always bigger than life. And I go back to him because that was my front and center visual mm -hmm. to big time hockey and to like yep. the that, generation right before bad, you. You know what I mean? And that was my best friend. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. um, so it turned into a, I'm not going to allow myself to have somebody think that they were going to be like, like I'm going to do what I want tonight. Yeah. That guy's not going to say a fucking thing. Oh, well, damn right. Hey, we can do this right now. <laughs> oh, right now? No, yeah, right now. 
Warm ups. Yep, warm ups, <laughs> swinging sticks, <laughs> chirp, and uh, and it just yeah, it, it evolved into something where I was like, wow, this is working for me. And it wasn't me pretending or whatever. It was this is this is how I'm going to stay on this team. This is how I'm going to, you know, get a paycheck. This is how I'm going to, you know, feel good about myself at the end of the night. You know, when I'm trying to work out with Joey Crabb and Dubinsky and Scott Gomez and Matt Carl and Timmy Wallace and Peter Cartwright and Billy Crum and Jason Grischuk and Todd Smith and Phil McKinnon, all these people I grew up with. And you know, this is like, oh yeah, that this is going to be my thing. Like, yeah. don't like don't think it's that I'm part. ever going to allow you to think yeah. that I'm not going to. I have to ask, um, <clears throat> have you have you met your match and or have you met your match multiple times? Like, have you, like, locked eyes and met that guy that was you over there too? Uh, I, w- I would say I've always met, you know, my match. You know, I'm not 6'5 I'm not or 6'6, six, six, two, okay. 250. Okay, yeah, great response. I, I uh, always had a fear. That I'd be that guy that we watch on the YouTube videos getting smoked. Oh. Yeah, you know, like, I, there's just no way you can get around it. Like, you just, like, that's an obvious um, reality of, 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 of fighting with other grown grown men who, who knew how to throw punches. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. I mean, no matter um, where it is, if you're on the rink or you're on the street yeah. or you're in high school or wherever, like, oh, you yeah. don't want to be that guy. No, and I, I watch it right there on 4th Avenue outside of, you know, Rum Runners, you know, yeah. the day. Like, I, uh, I think that fear helped me. Uh, I would never say, never, not even pretending, like, oh, you know, like yeah. We've seen, nobody we, ever yeah, got a piece seen, of me. We've seen the flexing or whatever. I just, I always maintain that that uh, desperation of, you know, I'm not getting beat up in front of my friends. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like, and when my friends are getting, they're not going to get with, beat like, up either. They're not getting beat up either. And, um, you know, I f- that was my role. Yeah, you know. And this whole gang of, of, of friends, that was me. I, I would do whatever for my friends. And, you know, you know, I would never hold it against a friend if they wouldn't do it for me. I just accepted that that was who I was. And it took me a while to really acknowledge that, mm. you know, because we all have different levels of codependency. And I think that was my introduction to it. Mm-hmm. And here we are as 40-year-olds, and we're seeing a lot of our friends that have fallen victim to Wait, it. who's, who's mm. 40? That's what I'm hey, 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 hey. I don't know what you're <laughs> But uh, 31, baby. No, this is, 29. This, but this isn't about trying to be the toughest guy. It's just about trying to be one of the guys. I care about my fucking friends. Mm. I love my teammates. Yeah. I am grateful to be held a cer- in a certain air you know like whether it's my teammates uh, in cincinnati or when i come back home and i'm on fourth avenue with my friends or whatever like my friends know that i'm going to be there for them i care about them um yeah i got a little wayward at times um but never towards them you know mm. um and you learn that that's where the real trust comes in and i really learned that that became my value or how i you know how i how i saw myself in life was how much my friends valued me Mm. Mm. um it wasn't by what i could pay for or whatever but i learned that you know i I felt like i got really good affirmation in terms of my friendship with people through jj's not coming over to drink all my booze not coming over to drink or smoke all my marijuana or you know uh you know you know uh stowaway on my dad's boat yeah or whatever you know what i mean like jj's my friend and he cares about me and and uh uh i i think i learned that was that was where i was going to find my my value in life was was just by what i could give yeah. you know and, and i talk about, a lot about what people i work with now about energy you know energy is uh you know that's something that we uh i think we thrive on you talk about you know when you you got covid on the uh, on the river mm-hmm. you know energy is that thing that um we need yeah. mm-hmm. and uh we, we talk about finding these ways to to generate energy because when we have it God, there's nothing to stop us yeah and not only generate yourself energy but yeah. ge- energize around everyone you. around you yeah yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah yeah transfer it yep um i want to play something and then i want to get your thoughts on uh that time period okay 
That's how it started. Uh, started with Van Halen, Guns N' Roses, Dean Trebojevic, Keith Morris, Dean Larson, Brian Kraft, Paul Craig, Doug Spooner, Derek Donald, Jeff Batters, um, down at the glass, like, oh my God, the Seawolves are like Led Zeppelin. Yep. You know, and I had no idea. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's all that mattered was, and uh, Brian Kraft was the first one to give me a puck. And uh, after a game? Yeah. Well, no in warm ups. Oh, you know, sweet. F- threw a puck over to me, and yeah. you know, Cooper Puck with the orange writing on mm-hmm. it. And uh, I took that thing home and uh, I slept with it. <laughs> uh, you know, and Mike Peluso was the, you know, I c- came into the, you know, Nitty gritty hockey schools, and Mike Pelosa was the first guy back. Yeah, so you're gonna make the all stars cross over, under, over, under, over, you know, shoulder up, you know what I mean? Like stick on the ice, and oh, I'm listening. Yeah, I'm listening, you know what I mean? And uh, getting a little fight with Jesse Wright and put my gum in his hair and whatever, give him a bloody nose, and you're on the verge of getting kicked out of camp. And I'm standing there in front of Court Cernich and Corey Mellon and everybody, and they're just like, you can't do that. You know what I mean? And I'm just like, well, f- fuck with me. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and uh, I got to stay in camp. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, broke a window, in your spot. Broke a window at UAA. Michael <clears throat> Picard, who we all know, uh, pretty grumpy guy, but uh, that's a guy who saw it all. <laughs> I don't know if you guys know this, but that guy at UAA, he saw it all. You know, the guy with the big, with the big gut, and uh, he dealt with it, and um, <laughs> God bless him, and I found myself on the wrong side of things with him a few times or whatever, but, uh, you know, as a mature adult, I hope he understands I, I, I respect him and, and uh, you know, for being a part of, you know, what we all came to love and, and appreciate and need growing up, and that, that was an activity, a, a passion. So, yeah, uh, UA, that, that, that means the world to me. Uh, obviously, I got some different feelings now after going through it and seeing how things have kind of been mismanaged a little bit and um you see hope now for what, I, what's to come maybe i i do see hope um you know i know matt um i know a few people involved uh, i know a few others that i you know don't think uh, the world of or whatever um i just like you guys um we've gotten the travel and, and, and we see the world how the rest of the world works and up here, unfortunately, we feel like people kind of g- get away with uh, being less than accountable. Yeah. And um, we're in a situation where we've got a beautiful campus um, in a situation where, you know, there's a lot going on for student athletes in terms of uh, experiences, whether it's, you know, military, uh, aviation, engineering, um, healthcare, uh, exploration, you know, whatnot. And, uh, you know, we're kind of let down by, by the business of the bureaucracy, you know, where, where things should be bigger, they should be help, healthier, more vibrant. And here we are, we, you know, we're looking for a, a lead to play in and, and all the efforts of these people that came before us that built the thing. And now it's just like, uh, this is where we're at. Yeah. And, uh, you know, being a part of it, you kind of got to see some of the things inside and just, uh, It's hard to stay um, optimistic um, when you don't see everything in terms of the mechanisms that have to turn and work to make things special not working. Uh, You can have the best people involved, and uh, it won't matter. So I I would say for me, you know, right now, without getting too much into it, I hope that Matt gets all the support he needs. Um, I hope that he's able to uh, get some players and through that, you know, more and more support. And eventually we can get back into a Division One league, uh, get the rink that we should have had years ago. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. um, that's a story. Yeah. I mean, it really should be a, a, a book or a report written about that. For sure. Because that was super corrupt to have one of the most magnificent Division Two facilities in the country 
sitting there without the ability to put rink, uh, a rink inside of it. Like, yeah. People have no idea how that happened, and uh, it's worth coming out eventually. Yeah, especially where the voters thought the rink was going in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I've seen some private emails that were kind of eye opening. Yeah. So I couldn't believe the first time I went in there. I'm like, well, wait a minute. This isn't going to be like. We paid for this? For no hockey, rink? too? Yep. Because yep. I thought, man, I feel like I could be wrong because I don't know a lot about that side of things. But I felt like, had it been established in there, mm-hmm. that the community would have really embraced it and engaged and and showed up yep. was it in the plan it i mean it was just like from the plan yep i don't know because i've been in there once for a volleyball game or twice yeah. now one for yeah. basketball and one for a volleyball game not like out of spite i'm just not like a huge volleyball basketball fan and it's not d1 yep. correct yeah, we only have a few d1 sports like let's get behind our d1 d1 sports yeah, yeah. And I, if anybody can do it, it would probably co- be Coach Shazby. Yep. Like, he seems pretty um, committed to excellence. He has a clear a clear reality of, of what has to happen. Oh, you know, for sure. Um, yeah. You know, and it needs to be said, too. I mean, a lot of people have no idea, but the futility of the uh, UA Athletic Department is what spawned the NCHC and the Big Ten. Because you had the CCHA that UAF belonged to and the, the WCHA that we belonged to. And through that membership, you received uh, dividends every year. And you were supposed to put that back into your program. And over the years, as you learn, they dissolved all the booster clubs here at UA. And mm-hmm. everything went into one pot. And, uh, you know, I'll let Scott tell his story. But there's there's stories about where guys wanted to do certain things, but we're told, well, you can do that, great, but it's going to go for this, and they're like, that's not what I want to go for. I want to go for that, mm. um, and it tore away the fabric of you know the, the blue liners and and mm. and uh, all that stuff that we 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 all saw growing up in terms of like you know if your dad was a blue liner, it's a big deal. Mm-hmm. You know, go go mm-hmm. down between periods and get a piece of pizza. <laughs> some popcorn you know what i mean a coke oh yeah that was dad, got, oh, dad yeah. got a beer we got a coke you know what i mean yeah um, joe's dad will bring us and <laughs> um what happened was is that you know some of these schools these bigger schools the big 10 ones were kind of like well there's this opportunity to kind of make this more of a thing and here we are flying up to anchorage and it's like man we t- the facilities are you know uh, and whatever right not really doing much of a favor pairwise ranking that's what they call it in hockey in terms of your rankings Mm. and you had michigan state michigan you had wisconsin and minnesota uh, minnesota in our league and then you had the division two schools st cloud color college denver maybe ohio North Dakota teams North, north dakota and these schools were all division two programs but had national hockey power division one hockey programs Mm. and so when the big 10 schools you know the ad's you know sat in a room with dr cobb and i don't want to you know you know god bless the man he's or whatever it was like all right okay we're not playing this game with these people anymore you know what i mean let's make a big 10 hockey league and out of that the rest of the schools are like all right well we're going to start our own league with the other serious hockey schools and that's what happened that is what happened no one's going to come on here and disagree with me on that that is actually what happened uh and you know we lost a um a local hockey coach that kind of had things going back in the right direction that was john hill who was passionate definitely passionate about you know passionate enough to hit me over the head with a hockey stick Mm. you know in practice (laughs) uh, to get to get my attention Uh, from here went to Bartlett and uh, we were going in the right direction and um, you know when you couldn't get certain things uh, 
I guess, confirmed for your assistance and, and, and things that were going to be kind of in line with where you saw things going or how they should go, you know, and here you're sitting, you're going to, you're a wife, you got two assistants or whatever, and then you've got, still got that pipeline back to Minnesota. Like there's a lot of things going on where, you know, I hope people get to really understand kind of what he was dealing with and thinking, uh, and cause they want to say he's being, you know, a jerk or, or totally selfish. And that's not what happened, you know, without a real commitment, you know, with a guy who wanted to be a hockey coach, you couldn't really stay here. Yeah. You know, and that's what happened. I mean, without getting too in the weeds with it, that's that's what happened. Yeah. So it makes sense too. Yeah. You know? you know, there's certain places in the world where, you know, if things don't progress, you get fired. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And uh, you know, we've all been around here long enough to where we see certain things operate at a high level and uh others and, and you know, not a lot happens or changes and um it's frustrating for me coming through a program like that where I saw things be a certain way and it was okay. You know, where and then when I learned in the professional world, like if you're not good enough, you're done. You're getting cut. You're fired. Um, so I'm hoping that we kind of step into that world here eventually, and, and hopefully Matt will see that through. Yep. High hopes. I mean, no, hope, so, hope so mm-hmm. for the uh, for the youth of Alaska and the and the kids coming up. I mean, I'm sure everyone on our age group. I mean, that was the highlight. Yeah. Of the weekend back then, if you're staying in town, was to go to UAA game. Yep. It was a huge deal, and, oh, and as an yeah. independent, <clears throat> yeah, yep. that was awesome. It, and it's it's actually cool to see UAF, yep, doing the things that they're doing, and they seem to be bigger than ever. Yep, you know, yeah. which is really cool. I think support is huge, um, you know, and and I think a lot of us are going to have to get over some hurt feelings, you know, and um, find a way to come back in and find where we can be valuable. To kind of see this thing kind of crawl back to what we want it to be, yeah, and uh, that's gonna you know that's that's gonna take some time and and, yeah. and some hard work and some uh, self reflection and it's not gonna be easy. No, not at all. Uh, and you see what's going on with the Wolverines, the juniors team. Yep. I mean that's being heavily embraced. Yep. Yeah, I, mean, I heard they're building a new arena over there across from Cabela's in that open thing. Yep. Oh, really? Yeah. Yep. Just well, for themselves. To, they're here to stay. Yeah. Yep. I mean, that's really all it takes. It just takes people to get involved. Yep. Get behind you know, the, it. The, the right people. Some right uh, management, some some future for, for, forward thinking, mm-hmm. you know, and because the audience is here. You yep. know, obviously in the heyday of, of the anchor of the Alaska Aces, I mean, the Sully was packed. Yep. I mean, it was, you know, 6,000 people in there. You couldn't get a ticket. Yep. So if you can do that once, you could do it again. Yes. You know what I'm saying? You can do it multiple times. I feel like it was taken for granted, too. Yes, it was. Man. Like, I can say I'm one of those people that probably should have went to more Aces games and more UAA games. But I went, and I enjoyed it. I like the vibe and the Mm -hmm. going with your friends in your 20s and, you know, going getting beers at the beer garden, watching Mike Lee and oh, yeah. Justin and just all the boys out there killing it. And it's like, now I'm like, I wish we had that so bad now. Yeah. Like yeah. I, I didn't, I, I felt like it was just always going to exist. Yeah. It would never go away. Yep. We had our sports. Mm-hmm. And then now it's like gone. Yep. And then you think about like, they talk about UAA disappearing. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Hold the phone. Yep. I'm not like a hardcore fan, but I don't want to see like high level sports just fucking disappear in Alaska. Yeah. That can't be. Yeah. Well, so. it, it, it digs into the inspiration of like sparking that, that um, inspiration like you did when you went there and you got that puck. Like when the, when the coolest hockey mm. that your kids see these days is, is your dad at the blue line. Like, dude, yeah. that's not going to inspire anyone. <laughs> no, man. No. It's not impressive <laughs> no. at all. It's not no. impressive. No. You know, but you go to a, a packed uh, Sullivan or whatever arena may come and, and you see the crowd bumping and, and just the, the energy that's in there. Yeah. Like yeah. that inspires people to Bob, maybe want to pursue up. that, you know? Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah and then you knew you had like connections to the players even like when we were kids and the mm-hmm. bathards were playing like you know you had like family friends that knew them you know and they're pretty young they went to the same high school as i did so yeah. it was like you were connected to them in some way it's like oh that's such a close reality you know yeah and i didn't play hockey but that was a big big reason why i think things thrive for a long time is we had the local players in the team yeah you know ua the aces 
and then we had a group of owners that really uh, invested in it. Yeah. And it wasn't until uh, the bureaucracy or the an, uh, analytics and, and changed when the NHL wanted to pull some of their teams, their parent or their affiliates from out east. Mm-hmm. It just changed the whole dynamic of the East Coast Hockey League, and, and it wasn't. It was not the the owners' fault. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Like these teams that we all play: Bakersfield, Stockton, Utah. Boise Vegas. or Vegas or whatever, like they became American League markets, and that meant the Aces had to travel farther. Yeah, and the league was like, mm-hmm. it's just no longer realistic to have you guys travel to you know Rapid City for your nearest right. away game. So, um, you know, it, just, it, it was uh, you know the world changing really is what kind of yeah. kind of crushed it. But uh, you know, there's no reason why we can't. Rev it back up. No, yeah, for sure. And yeah. it all started with UAA anyway. Yep. yep. So UAA was the, the sellout house every night growing yeah. up. And and I've met uh, Mr. Parnell, and uh, he's a really good man, and I really hope that uh, he's got enough energy left to kind of want to push this thing into being um, more of an energy because I, I think the potential is there to have a, a hockey league on the West Coast, you know, USC, UCLA, Washington, Washington State, UAA, yeah. or whatever. Well, even you got it's like there. Arizona State and yeah. these, these like crazy places that yeah. you wouldn't think have yeah. hockey that have, you know, high level hockey mm-hmm. going on. Like or, there's, yeah, Oregon, Oregon State. Like that's yeah. a reality. Yeah. 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 Hockey's you know. getting bigger. Yeah. Yeah. What was logistics in Alaska? Was that one of the biggest challenges and hurdles that? You had to overcome and may have ended up being the kind of end of it. Was it just because it was we're just so out of the damn way? Uh, it was that, and I, uh, I think back then it was easier for parents to sacrifice. Now it's harder. I think parents to look at more variables now when they invest in their kids' sports. Um, um, it seem it seems like like for the UAA downfall, it was like we're not investing locally. All these other mm-hmm. programs, like North Dakota, got you know the mm-hmm. first stadium really with yep. Ralph Ingolstead. But then everyone followed, and their facilities got awesome. Mm-hmm. And and when your fil- facilities the get awesome, supported it right. Not only do you get pl- attract players that are like, oh, these people care. Yeah. Like I show up and I have a D one legit facility that to work out in, and then the separate rink to skate in for practice, and then this legit rink with like real locker rooms yeah. and all this stuff to skate in. But then the community shows up. And they get to go to a nice facility to watch their team play. And when, you know, we didn't have that show up here, Mm -hmm. but all the competitor schools did, Mm -hmm. you're not going to attract good talent and your team's going to suck. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Not only do you not attract the local talent, you're not going to attract any talent from outside of the state either. Oh, right. You know, and that's what happened. That's yeah. what happened. It was. It's, it's just like we just didn't have the facilities, and to pay for us to play in the Sullivan Arena just was wasn't viable anymore. Yeah. And so they moved over to the, to the university, and the league was very clear about like once you do that, you're done. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, man, that's the truth. Yeah. So you go from UAA. Was it an immediate jump to the Aces? How, how was that transition? Um, we all we all lived through it. Where the Aces, that was the best thing going. Yeah. And uh, for me, um, it was I, I would say impossible to make the team. Uh, I was lucky enough to be there with those six at the end of the uh, UA season, where I could kind of you know just be an extra guy or or, or, a, or a strong, good, warm body. So you come in the next year, 07, you know, training camp, and they're sending their affiliates down on players that they signed or were intended to play a certain role. And here I was. I hadn't. I was unproven. Mm. You know, I played at UAA. I was a grinder. I was a hardworking guy. And, you know, I, I was functional or whatever, but I wasn't proven to be an entity in terms of uh, the role. And so it just made me easy to kind of get rid of. And uh, so I did that. And... I had a really hard time thinking about, oh, am I just going to go just sit in the phone all day and try to call these coaches and beg to be on their team? Mm That's not really how things work. It's professional, you know, minor league sports. So Louis Mass was uh, retired at that year, which is perfect timing for me because then I just rolled right into working with him. And I was like, well, I guess I'm just going to figure out that I guess I'm not going to play hockey anymore and I'm just going to coach kids. But that felt good. Yeah. Mm. I, I didn't feel like a loser. I was like, all right, well, I'm, I'm helping kids, and uh, I'm going to get my degree. Mm-hmm. I'm going to finish that. So, oh six, oh seven, I was not on a team. And, um, you know, there's going to be some names that people haven't heard, but, you know, without them, I just, it's, none of this would have happened. And uh, I'm sitting 
you know, going to a couple justice classes at UA, working for Louie, uh, you know, putting my skates on, skating on that plastic ice from, you know, 3.30 <laughs> to 8 p.m. at night and having Maria, you know, and, you know, just like, what the hell are you doing? Like, where, where's this going? You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Get your shit together, boy. Yeah, and then just, you know, like, man, I, oh, I just... Uh, max out this credit card, you know what yeah, I mean, yeah. to, to take you out to eat and whatever. I mean, you get it. Like, um, it was, I had no idea what the hell was going on. And I got a phone call at like 5 a.m. in the morning. It was uh, the Boise or the Idaho Steelheads coach saying, Hey, um, uh, we're coming up to uh, play the Aces, and I got, I don't have enough players to play this weekend. Do you want to play? And I was like, Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, like, you know, um, okay. I'm going to play against aces. Yeah. They had cut me like two or three months before. And, you know, I had no like grand ideas. Like, I'm going to go out there and beat everybody up. You know, that was not like, yeah, yeah. you know, I hadn't proven myself to be that yet or anything yeah, like yeah. that. I was just like, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to play at the Sullivan Arena and my friends are going to see it. Like, yeah. okay. So I showed up and played that weekend. Uh, I think, you know, played well on, on adrenaline. And so what happened was, is, um, that was one of the better teams in the league that year. Mm -hmm. And so most of their team was called up the whole season. So they always needed players. And so mm. they would call me and I would meet them in uh, Fresno. I would meet them in Long Beach. I would meet them in Oh, they'd Vegas. call you to be like me just yeah, over there? Yeah, they'd fly, to, fly me down to Boise or whatever. And yeah. I ended up playing, I think, 20 games that year. Yeah. Well, not really. You know, I, I was a uh, you know I was teaching kids. I was teaching boys and girls. Oh, it was just I like, was, hey, come this say not signed. Yeah, just I, I would I would take a flight at like Thursday afternoon and, and uh, get down there and tilt that up a little bit. You know, get there in time to get a breakfast burrito and <laughs> get on the ice and take a nap. And I guess you know eat whatever uh, you know frozen thing that the other guys were eating. You know, and go down there and pretend to be a, a hockey player. So then the next year. Uh, I thought I'd played enough, and Keith McCambridge would get the coach, Keith McCambridge, uh, mm -hmm, on the Aces. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, okay, well, he's like, yeah, well, we're going to bring you in, you know. Because at that point, you know, honestly, he doesn't know what he's getting from the Blues, the St. Louis Blues. So I show up with every intention of like, okay, I'm going to finally make the team. And um, I get cut. And, you know, he pulls me into the office, and he tells me that, you know, I'm not going to, you know, make the team. And... You know, at, at that point, I'd had enough of the vitriol or, or um, the you know, people doubting me and, you know, my good friends even. Um, like, yeah, you you are not like, that's not you. Like, you know, as nice as they could, but, you know, like, <laughs> you're not like, you're not that guy. You're not Mike. You're not, yeah. you know, Scott. You're not these guys. Like, you're just, you're done. Yeah. You know? And I just didn't acknowledge it. I don't know, if I, was just fight. Too, I don't know if I was just too stupid or whatever. And I was like, no, I... I, I for some reason, I feel like the, like I can like I should be playing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't got to quit. In me. I feel like I, I feel like I try harder than other people, and I feel like I'm stronger and whatever and and capable. And I honestly felt like he really struggled to cut me. Mm. Oh, you know, um, he was reluctantly. I feel like basically. he. I feel like he was just like, look, this is the way it is. I'm getting these players coming down to me, and I. I cannot keep you. Yeah. Um, suck to, to have that, you know, you're, you're not good enough thing. And uh, that could, could kind of be a lot of the story is just kind of fighting that, that notion. So I'm not on a hockey team again. Here I am, you know, finished my degree with UA, did an independent study at McLaughlin, which was super, uh, I would say very, eye -opening. very eye-opening in terms of uh, <laughs> the world, yeah, and and the things that are unfortunate, um, yeah, kids. And so, stuff. but what happened was is maybe a week or two later, settling into like, okay, I guess I've got to go get a job. Mm. Um, one of the players on the Utah team or the Idaho team was playing for Utah, and I guess he had told his coach that like I play with this dude like. JJ and he was way better than this guy you know what I mean like you yeah. know or whatever like we can pay him 300 bucks a week and, and he'll show up like and uh, got a phone call again early in the morning and uh, you know it was still when I was yeah you know, and uh, but it wasn't you know and <laughs> hey uh, you want to come down I got to pay uh, 395 a week before taxes you know, I don't know what that is after taxes. That's for you to figure out. But uh, if you want to come down and play, like, uh, I got a spot for you. 
you know, uh, Birdie says you're great. He's like, yeah, JJ, come on. Like, you know, yeah, yeah. You know, he threw out some drive talk that I used to talk to him when I was playing or whatever. <laughs> On speakerphone? Or yeah. Oh, yeah. We're on speakerphone and you know, the old school conference phone. And I, and I said, yeah, I'd be like a, you know, I hate to say it, but, um, you know, I won't say the whole thing. But I was like, yeah, I'm going to be a runaway, whatever. I'll be desperate. Yeah, that's what I hear. That's what I hear, son. Or whatever. Um, send me your birth date and your social security number and uh, whatever. We'll see you soon. And I got the phone. I was like, oh, shit. I, I got a team to play on. Yeah. I guess it's not done. Yep, I'm back. I, I'm back, and I and I showed up in Salt Lake City, Utah, and and uh, they're just like, yeah, well, um, you're gonna fight, right? You know, <laughs> that's what they say right away. Well, pretty much. Yeah, like, like you're gonna fight. This right? is your role, right? Like you're are you gonna fight, right? Like yeah. that's gonna be your thing. And I was like, I, I guess. <laughs> I hadn't had a chance I mean, to I really can play hockey too. But yeah. yeah, and um, <laughs> but that was it was real. Like you, like you understand. Like you need to deal with certain things that we're not sure you're used to dealing with. Like when you see certain bravado or machismo out there or whatever, that's something you need to go check. Yeah, you know, um, when we play a game, it's just unacceptable to have a certain energy not being reciprocated or countered. And countered more heavily mm -hmm. in our fashion. You know, we have this guy that he's old, doesn't really want to do it too much anymore. So that's why he brought you here. Yeah. <laughs> to be the young whatever. Well, I think that's very um, valiant of them to be up yeah. front and open and honest yeah. from the Here, get go. Here's your role. Yeah. yeah. And uh, luckily for me, but when I think about it now, I think the, one of the reasons why that guy was took such care of me was he didn't want to have to do it uh and he saw me as his way out i know a guy that can do this you know he already had his post hockey plans he wanted to move to san diego and run a nightclub and yeah mm. he was a great guy and Been so punched he, enough yeah he invested in like <laughs> you're gonna be the guy okay so like i don't want them looking at me i want you to be the one that he's passing uh, the baton yeah deals with it and i was like okay okay like yep. maybe i get to be cool now like, yeah, yeah. I'm, a, I'm a hockey player that's right so um uh, played that season and uh hey, go I, good. I didn't have like tremendous like you know huge fighting um statistics penalty minutes if you will and, and, and fight majors but um it wasn't for lack this of is trying. the grizzlies this is the grizzly it wasn't for lack of trying 118 penalty minutes so i i did have you know i had my moments but i got to play and um on the west you had an older side of the east coast hockey league or no, you you had West, you had Victoria, you had Vegas, you had the California teams, you had a lot of guys that were out here getting paid a lot of money, so you didn't have the the guys that were trying to come up. Okay, so it was kind of yeah. hard for me to find dance partners. So a lot of times I'd run around just looking for it, and I wouldn't get it. I wouldn't find it. Whereas in the other divisions out east teams that were closer to the american league affiliates you know that's where they're really duking it out and those are the guys getting called up or whatnot you know i didn't know i didn't care all i know is like well i still had my teeth and you know <laughs> like I'm, i get to still i get to still stay on playing hockey and so it was whatever go back to next year um the assistant coach is now the head coach loved him but he was a bit of a you know uh guy mm -hmm. got it mm -hmm. <clears throat> and uh not really doing too well. And it's kind of a funny story because Cincinnati had actually called earlier in the season to try to get me to see if they could, you know, acquire me. And he told them no. Um, but the season didn't, you know, was clearly not going the right direction. At that point, he was so far in whatever he was got, where, whatever he had going on, he was just wanting to bring his friends in, you know. Um, and it got super disorganized and toxic or whatever. And he actually cut me. Oh, wow. Actually, cut me. Probably did you a favor, could, though, yeah? Right? Could have, could have traded me, but he actually cut me. So I was in a uh, an apartment in Salt Lake City for a good week, just sitting there because you do. So you wait a while, you kind of figure out with the team, like how 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 uh, how long are they willing to keep you in the apartment before they're just like, all right, time for you to fucking go home. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we're done paying for it. Yeah. yeah, you know what I mean. Like we're gonna see how long and see if anybody wants you, or if you're just like yeah. you know dust in the wind here, like or whatever. It's just in limbo, and. uh my roommate came home and gave me a cheap-ass sticky note, and it said Chuck Weber, 
with a with a number on it. And he said, "Yeah, coach told me to call you. Told you to call this number." And the kid's like twenty years old. It's a snot nose, just rat. <laughs> yeah, I'm just like yeah, whatever. I'm like you, you know. need another one of those. Yeah, yeah. You ready for another? Mm-hmm. Yeah. How about you, Jack? So I. Uh, so I call the coach, Chuck Weber, super nice guy. This is like a cyclone, Cincinnati coach? Such a nice cyclone. So mm-hmm. he goes, hey, um, you know, this is weird because I, 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 w- I asked to see if we could kind of get you early because we really needed you. And now you're just sitting there like, do you want to come play? Do you still want to come play? And I said, uh, yeah. Yeah, I still want to come play. But in the back of the mi- my mind, I was just like, well, what does that mean? Like, that means I'm actually going to really have to do it. Yeah. And um, so I, I – sh- He's like, all right, well, I'm going to get you a flight, you know, and uh, we'll see you soon. Can't wait to get you in a lineup and, and have you be a part of the team. Um, we got a lot of good players. We just need a little bit of that that extra edge, and we're hoping you can provide it, you know, and, yeah. and hopefully it works out. So it still had that air of, like, well, I mean, it's not for sure. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So uh, get on a plane. I show up. I'm walking up and down the, some street in uh, Cincinnati, Ohio you know, the gas stations and big freeways and shit that I'm just not used to being from Anchorage. And I'm just like, man, what the fuck am I doing here? <laughs> like I'm 26 or whatever. And I'm just like, I'm uh, okay. I'm, uh, like I'm a goon, I, I guess. Like I'm, I don't feel like a goon. I'm not like, you know, I'm not a giant, you know, I'm not Mike, you know, cause that's what, that's what I yeah uh, equated a lot of this to was Mike, mm. you know? And uh, like, am I going to be able to kind of, create that aura you know because that's what they expect shit i knew that's what they expected yeah show that, up new that team edge yeah new showed up you know what i mean and, and uh, luckily there were some guys i played against in college that were super friendly to me and and were excited to see me or whatever and, like, and welcome with open arms welcome yeah welcome me with open arms and mm. and uh i was just like i guess like do do whatever you want like that's why i'm here you know go to the house slash the goalie whatever i don't you know fuck it i'll be right there yeah like really i said well, um, yeah, <laughs> like, like really, like I'll be there. I guess I mean that's why I'm here, right? Yeah. They're like, oh, oh I, I guess because they were college kids. They were from Minnesota. They were from Chicago or whatever. They weren't like major junior hockey players that grew yeah. up with the whole fighting thing. And they're like, great, you know. So <sighs> here it was, like it was every night. It was every night, and uh, I honestly struggled with those emotions, you know, turning them on and turning them off because it's it's something that just comes, and then it's over, and then it's just you're supposed to move on. Mm. Short and, memory. Yeah, and so what happened was is, you know, I carried some kind of, like, uh, aura, like, don't fuck with me. I don't care if you're on my team or on the other team. Like, you know, don't, like, we're on a, ride, we're on a sleeper bus, you know, riding all night between, you know, Reading, Pennsylvania, and Mississippi, you know, or whatever. And I'd get up in the middle of the night to go pee or throw away my Subway sandwich. Because that's what you ate. You know, you ate Subway and Arby's yeah. and whatnot. And I'd be like, don't think that you can give me your trash and I'm going to throw it up because I got up. Fuck you. You you throw your trash away. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Uh, and that was just weird. I didn't I didn't like. Feel like yourself? Yeah, they weren't disrespecting me. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, And I think that was just weird these emotions were starting to manifest themselves in a way that was kind of negative. Yeah. And I, I, I had not learned how to handle it. Mm. Uh, and I got in a few situations with some teammates um, where it went all the way back to when I was felt like I was getting picked on. Mm. I was like, wait a minute, like I'm showing up and I'm being the guy. Like, don't think that I'm going to be like dealing with that shit. You know, yeah. I don't know if it was misplaced egotism or whatever. And I remember the coach sitting down with me. He's like, look, um, do you know that if you act a certain way with your own teammates, like they see what you do for them against the other team, but when you do that to people that depend on you, like that's not creating any kind of trust. Mm. And I was like, oh, shit. Mm. That makes sense. Yeah. Like, uh, and I equated that to everything, you know, being a father, being a friend or whatever. And I was like, okay, like I want my teammates to respect me or whatever, but how can they do that if I'm snapping on them and I'm, I've oh, got yeah, all totally. these negative emotions because I'm feeling like, well, don't, like, yeah. you know. Don't you're, like, you're like sabotaging don't, don't, don't treat yourself. Me. Yeah. yeah, and I was, and, and he, and he, and he, um, he caught it. Um, he caught it before I buried myself. Before it was too late. Before it was too late. And so I learned like, no, dude, you're, 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 appreciated and um you know you're not like the 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 cheerleader but you 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 represent a certain energy energy Mm -hmm. that we need that is appreciated but you take away from it if you 
act a certain way. And that was a big thing for, for, for when I matured. And I think that was a big turning point for me. Looking back, like on your other teams that you're on, mm-hmm. like, you know, UA or whatever, you know, the Aces and Utah, um, that inconsistency and that vitality, that um, volatility that you just brought up, did you see that in the back and you're like, oh, yeah. I could have fixed that years ago and it took this long to grow? Or I go back to that, just like feeling insignificant, being uh, less than uh, respected. That insecurity. And seeking that out when it wasn't really what the case yeah. was. Um, mm. It was a hot button for you. It was a hot button for me. It mm-hmm. was that feeling of, of insignificant or whatever yeah. and having to constantly prove myself um but that's wasn't what it was really about i was learning life yeah yeah like totally. you, you like hey we're doing this together day in and day out like you don't just get to be that guy that you were in high school and that's why like when i'm sitting around and i have too many drinks i'm talking to my friends or whatever and i get a little frustrated like people just want to think that they are like what they still were in high school I'm like, no you know like you have to evolve you have to keep proving yourself and that's the reason why i love what you guys are doing um we'll get to that too, i'm sure later but it was hey um you are really good at what you do but you take away from it when you exhibit emotions or behavior that makes your teammates think that now they got to be tiptoeing around you yeah yeah because they want to love you man yeah you know what i mean but mm-hmm. when you do that yeah it's hard they can't that. trust you and i was just like wow and that it's was real. that was a really big deal for me and i would never got that if someone didn't care about me yeah and I always go back to that is, is in, in uh, having people care about you. Yeah. You know, so J- this period in time, you know, JJ and I are pretty good friends. And, um, I mean, w- Matt Mateo and I were huge JJ fans, you know, because w- JJ got to a point where, you know, when he was leaving with the aces and it wasn't working out, like he was making that life decision. Like, am I going to continue in hockey? And we're sitting there as like friends that care mm-hmm. about JJ dating uh, sisters yeah <laughs> dating sisters um <laughs> and just to like see his drive to go like no i'm gonna i'm gonna push and i'm gonna keep going and th- it was impressive and it was inspirational but it was cool because at this time we were nerding out on his stats and look at him up and yeah and look at his goals they like, you know you're you're you did well, really just, good in this period yeah, yeah it you just know? seemed like you took that energy you, like, you got that call up. and you just like tripled up i mean games yeah. played gold scored yeah. uh, penalty minutes but the reason i was bringing that up was because you know in life you know and i've been in some situations with you that were not um that na- nature could have could have dri- driven us yeah. other directions and we can get into that later but you know stressful yeah. um but we're on the same side you know yeah. um but you know just outdoor dangerous kind of nature stuff and uh man like i never saw anything but the kind spirited human that's right in front of us right mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. it's really cool to that you're being so open about yeah. how you're you know growing through this period yeah. and some of you know yeah. your struggles I, I i think it's important because i would have had i not had these uh, revelations or whatever it just wouldn't have happened because i watched it not work out for so many guys yeah so i got to see the uh the, the rise and the, fall the schisms of people's personality traits that kind of sabotage their potential yeah um we won't get into that too much um but I witnessed it, and uh, uh, it made all the difference in the world. And that's why I hope that, you know, obviously people feel a certain way about, like, oh, I can't believe blah, 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 and there's that energy. Like, I don't think this makes them a bad person or whatever, but I think that um, certain people around town were just like they couldn't believe it. But they didn't realize that, you know, a lot of the energy, good or bad, was helping me. Yeah. You know, I didn't want to be that chump. They they wanted to think that I was. Mm, you channeled it right. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I would I would uh I would see certain people, you know, and, and we talk about Jace and, and, and Mike and, and certain people and they're just like, Man, I don't I don't I don't think you're like a tough guy, dude. And you're standing there in F Street with your drink in your hand, you're just like, What? What? <sighs> Damn. Because <laughs> I hadn't proven it yet. Yeah. And um you know, to be out there, you know, I went from, you know, five or six fighting majors to 33. Mm-hmm. And I got there on December 7th. So between the 
December 7th and, you know, May, I had fought 30 times. You know what I mean? Yeah, almost uh, every other game. You know, and much. I, you know, like, it wasn't like I had a bunch of money in my pocket, but I could barely even get my hands in my pocket. Because they're so swollen. Yeah, you know what I mean? And, um, <laughs> but luckily nothing was in there. <laughs> but, uh,. <laughs> I, I did what I needed to do, and through that, the guy was very good to me. Let me pick where I wanted to play. I got to come home and play for the uh, for the Aces, and Brent Thompson, who was a hard-nosed guy, hard-nosed guy, who lived it. And um, because of what had happened the year before in, uh, with the Cyclones, boom. Yeah. I was on the team. And you came, and you even yep. had better numbers. Yep. Wasn't going to be no bullshit. I was on the team. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to sit there in my apartment or at Louis Mass's house. Yeah. Yeah, in limbo. Being like, hey, Louis, like, I know you're helping coach your team, but am I on the team? I am on the team. Like, yeah. Like, come, like you know, I to I'm, on, I'm on the team. Yeah. You know, I finally get to be an Alaska. So I finally get to have Bob Lester get excited about me on the radio or over the megaphone. And here I am, like, God dang it. I'm an old, I made it. I'm on the aces, you know? Uh, yeah. And. You know, I hate to admit it, but that's that was really kind of like the zenith of what I kind of mm. thought for myself. Yeah, I you mean, thought you were at the top there. That I was, really, that I, was really, the I thought pinnacle. I thought that I was at my top, mm -hmm. and you were a huge fan favorite. You know, yeah, you know, and huge. I maintained the same energy just in terms of like I wasn't going to let anybody in the rink not think I wasn't ready. Yeah, yeah, and I took that through to the American League where I was just like, okay, you come to the rink. There I am, like, I wasn't going to have your dad or anybody be like, well, it doesn't look like he wants to fight. Yeah. What yeah. the hell is he doing out there? Yeah, score not scoring any goals. Yeah. You know what I mean? Is he going to fight? You know what I mean? I had that. I'd be sitting on the bench, and I'd be just like, nothing's happening. Nothing's happening or whatever. And I would just We like, need some energy. Yeah. So a lot of times, I would just get it go over with right away. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I started in warm-ups. Yeah. And uh, I've seen some videos of that. That was another, that was another step where it was just like, you're out there in warm-ups, the music's playing, you're snapping the puck around, mm -hmm. you're supposed to feel good about what the hell's going on, and here I was pacing the red line being like, hey, 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 right away, let's go. You know what I mean? Like, And they're just like, what are you talking about, man? Like, what are you talking about? The game hasn't started yet. Yeah. And I'm just like, no, no, dude, like, I've been thinking about it all day. I'm looking for you. I'm looking for you. Like, I don't hate you, but we're doing this. Do you yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. Like, people are here that watching me, my buddies, yeah. my, my buddies parents like passed out like 18 tickets yeah like i have to perform i know you have fans too yep. you know yep. what i mean yep. like there's no such thing as people come to the rink expecting me to do something me not do it yeah like this is the end for me <laughs> like this is my this is my encore yeah this is what i do and um so then i got into coaching and uh you know merritt waldrop's you know one of my best friends godfather to all his kids and and uh i was all in you know i had a girlfriend at, at that time and she had a child, and, and uh, so I was just like, okay, well, I guess I get to be that guy now. Yeah. You know, I get to be that aces guy, and then that'll parlay itself into a great job. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. I'm telling you, 1,000%. I get to be an ace. Maybe I'll sell real estate. I'll be a project manager. I'll be a sales guy, or I'll be, like, in marketing or whatever. And, you know, I had, I'll have this aces thing to kind of leapfrog me. That is 100% yeah. what I thought. Yeah. And... uh here we are, you know, the next year, um, you know, playing for Brent Thompson, loved playing for him. He pushed me, challenged me, got to play with Jason Risner and a lot of our buddies. Louis Mass, who I lived with, yeah, was the assistant coach. So you can imagine, like, that, that that's who I am. Like, I'm going to be a part of this as long as I fucking can. Yeah. You mm -hmm. know, until it parlays itself into something that's you know, I can learn to live with. Yeah. So... We're, in, we're into that second season. It's understood that, you know, I go to I go to Chipotle. No, Qdoba. Qdoba. We're not good enough yet for, for yeah, Chipotle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're yeah, not we there yet. Chipotle. I go yeah, to, yeah, Chip I go right. to I go to Qdoba right. on Abbott. I meet Brent Thompson because mm -hmm. he lived over there off of between um, O'Malley and, um, and uh, Huffman on Alderwood in that new neighborhood. So it was easy for him. He's like, all right, uh, give me 50 bucks more. You know, then you got like, oh, all right, done. You know what I mean? All right, great. I just loved that it was easy. So um, coaching with Merritt, you know, obviously, you know, I'm going to miss some practices or games or whatever, but still it's going to mean something to the parents that you have a ace. Uh, you, you, you have an aces guy that's invested in the whole thing. And once you get to 15, 16 years old, you, you want your kids to have someone that's, you know, at that point, you know, your dad's, you know, no one's listening to their dad. Anymore, yeah, yeah, unfortunately. yeah. So I, 
I got a lot of that. I got, a, I got another level of, uh, or dynamic of affirmation mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. a lot of local people that yeah. were showing me respect from and showing me a certain kind of like, they wanted me to involved with their children. Yeah. Yeah. I took huge. that really seriously. Yeah. Yep. I took that really seriously. Land in Detroit. And get this uh, voicemail. Uh, Justin uh, Johnson, this is uh, Ron Hextall. And uh, I want to talk to you about uh, your plans for next hockey season. I understand you're probably going to play for the uh, Aces there, but uh, we got a situation here I want to talk to you about. Um, but that was all he said. Ron Hextall called you? Ron Hextall. <laughs> How'd that feel? But I'm, I'm walking through the airport in Detroit, and I'm just like, what the fuck? Like, is this some like black hockey thing? Yeah, because yeah. he knows I'm coaching and, and, and I can do some stuff for the Kings, like gra grassroots. Yeah, yeah. No, serious. I thought it was like a grassroots thing that yeah. <laughs> they had. And uh, I'm just like, Merritt, did Ron Hexall just called me? He's like, what? Wow. Ride the tram to Avis. And uh, I'm like, Merritt, I know we got to get these rental cars. We got like 18, you know, snotty nose, you know, sweaty teenagers waiting to, you know, go to the hotel. I'm like, well, I, Merritt, I have to call this guy back. I'm like, I, I got to call him back right now. Ron Hextall just called me. I called him. He goes, hey, uh, I'm talking to, uh, to the uh, Ontario rain coach so that you were in their warm-ups drinking all their water bottles, throwing them in the stands, and uh, you, you're probably the toughest guy in the league. And I was like, wow. He said that <laughs> <laughs> in my head. You know what I mean? Like, because <laughs> it does suck. Because I was really getting away with murder. You know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. um, I love the aces. I was just so you know mm -hmm. that, that was to me that was it. He goes, well, uh, we're going to be having our tough guy up this year. Like he's probably going to make the team. So we, we we're looking for somebody in Manchester because we've got a couple guys that we want to play a hard nosed game, but we don't want them having to deal with uh, that dynamic every night because we want them to develop. Okay, like in my head, I'm like, what does that mean? Like, because for me at that point, I was learning how to fight by watching YouTube. Yeah, yeah. And those were all the YouTube, or the a American League and NHL, or former NHL battle axes, you know, duking it out. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, no, not me. Like, no, not me. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I, I think I'm like a fly guy around Anchorage. Like, I'm not going to go get my face punched off or smushed yeah, yeah. up. You know what I mean? And I'm just like, I'm not just going to go to a training camp and get sent home and, and, and be like, oh, yeah, pff, you thought you were going to play in the American League? JJ, really? Mm -hmm. So I said, hey, uh, Mr. Exel, can I call Brent and have him, you know, talk to him and have him call you? And so I called Brent and I'm going, hey, uh, I got a call from Ron Exel. He goes, what? You know, because, you know, if you're coaching a minor league hockey team, there's a certain elements you're trying to fill a team with. And, like, that's, a to him, a major part of the team. Yeah. Mm, good way to put it. Who's going to play Who's gonna, Who's gonna? play that role? Yeah. yeah. Because, in enforcer. you know, who, who's that guy can depend on that will <clears throat> be what I need him to be? Provide yeah. the energy. And I would like to think that I had proven that to him. And so, obvious for him, he was just like, what? This is his worst nightmare, right? Like Jesus, you can't just find these guys everywhere. You can, you can find them, and oh. they're you know they're, you know, quote unquote, like, oh yeah, they they're going to be the guy, but most of them are sleepy and they really don't want to fight, yeah. or they're really not desperate or whatever. So uh, he calls me back. I'm in the the van driving on the broken ass pavement through Detroit. You know, oh uh, eight, mm. no 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 oh nine. Yeah, nine no, 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 2000, 2010. Yeah. Like, you know, when Detroit was kind of going through it. And he's just like, uh, no, he's not, he's not fucking around. He said, as long as you show up and you got your shit together, you're on the team. And I was just like, oh, damn it. You know, like, I don't know if I can do, I don't know if I can do that. Yeah, you know, yeah. I got the girlfriend. I'm feeling kind of good where I'm at. I've been at this level for three or four years now. Like, mm -hmm. I'm the guy. Like, I, I didn't know if I wanted to kind of mm -hmm. put myself out there. And um, you never saw a pass where you were I, I right did, i did not i saw it in my dreams yeah and i saw it when i was around scott mm -hmm. when i was around brian when i was around joey when i was around dubinsky i saw it then when i'm yeah. skating with them but not for yourself didn't i never thought i was as good as them never ever mm. thought that yeah um i would just visualize myself like what's it like to be fucking scott gomez yeah in the show madison square garden like fucking mm -hmm. lugging the puck on the power play that's never going to be me but maybe i could be his tough guy yeah. you know yeah far-fetched like never thought that was me still and uh so i um i stayed for a day or two i didn't stay the whole trip i had to fly right back home 
get my shit together and fly out to uh, New Hampshire. Got out there. Um, obviously, everybody's super nice to me because they're like, oh, I guess, so you're going to be the guy? <laughs> <laughs> you're not as tall as that guy usually looks, but, I mean, yeah. you've got you some look muscles. pretty strong. You look pretty strong. Your arms you are long or whatever. I, we hear you're left-handed. That, that That's kind of a thing, I guess. And so um, I was there and uh, made the team. And uh, the first team that we played, it was Jeremy Yablonski. The guy had a freaking mohawk. Just the scariest human being you've ever seen on skates. And uh, if you want to look it up on YouTube, Jeremy Yablonski, like, you know I'm not lying. Let's look it like, up. I am not lying. Like the scariest human being you've ever seen on skates. Big guy? Yeah, just... A tower. I mean, just spread out of the prison hall. Just not like I mean, more more than the guy that held the muscles in the gym. Man, he looked like just just ready for war. Like you know, any kind of sci fi thriller we grew Lebonsky? up watching. He's like Yablonski. Y a b l o n s k i. Oh, Yablonski. Yeah, Jeremy Yablonski. There it there is. He is. Um, Ice hockey player. And, uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> he's like one of those no Look at this guy. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Just a machine, and here I am. I'm a you know a guy at the East Coast <laughs> Hockey League. Yo, uh, is he straight out of fucking uh, Chechnya or what? His, skull, I mean, his skull's not even round, so but he's got to be like hard but, to hit. It's but, just a flex off. Just an egg. But if you guys had him in front of you, man, you just love him to death. But still, like to go against him, you're just like, oh man, like. And so obviously, I think the first night I'm sitting out, but we play Bridgeport where he's on the team and. It's like, Johnson, you're in. You know, you're playing. He's playing, so you're definitely playing. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you know, because if you don't play, then we're definitely losing tonight, and it's going to be embarrassing. We're not going to go near the front of the net. We're yeah. not going to dig a puck out of the corner, and it's going to be a long <laughs> afternoon, right? <laughs> and so um, had to fight him my first two times in the American Hockey League, and, uh, you know, I, you know, definitely didn't win. Um, but mm. stood my ground and, and, and took it and, uh, you know, going home and sitting at home or sitting on the bus cause it was a home and home kind of thing with them. And I was just like, you know, man, if that's the worst it's going to be, man, I might be okay. Uh. I might be okay. And that actually made me confident mm. and actually in a weird way made me confident. I was like, well, if he's the scariest guy in the league and I'm still here and I'm okay, well then fuck it. Let's go. Yeah. You know, why wouldn't I just continue with what I've been doing? Yep. And see what happens. Embrace it. Yep. I'm, uh, I, I've chose. I've made this sacrifice. I've I've shunned reality. I yeah. guess I'm going to be a minor league hockey league and uh, a player, and we'll see what happens. So it's just going at it. Yeah. You know what I mean? And um, you played in that league quite a few years. Yeah. And I, and I, and I think it was the same thing as when I was in the East Coast Hockey League, where it was yeah, like, man, this guy just is like in warm ups. I'm hearing it. Like, I initially was just like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> to like, hey, this is happening. Just so you know, I'm ready. You don't got to go in the locker room and be confused or second guessing or not knowing what the hell's going on. You're going to know right now, hey, when we get on the ice together, like we'll go for it. We're, we're, we'll go for it. Okay, you know what I mean. <laughs> How that make the others feel like coming I, out like and that? And I saw, and I saw, it, and they were confused. Yeah, uh, they were like, like well, "Oh, I created this I've, weird dynamic." I've never heard of you. Where the <laughs> fuck do you come from? Like, I'm gonna go back in the locker room and look at your your stat. <laughs> look you up real quick. <laughs> and it's not, you're not drafted. You're five ten. Like, who have you fought? I fought everybody, and you just can't wait to fight me. What? Jeez, I'm okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> and I may or may not should be nervous. Yeah, and um, because I was on a short-term contract, which meant that after a certain amount of days, they could just send me back to the aces. So oh, now, okay. now I was there. I was just like, well, shit. Okay, well, now I better stay because if I go back, like, yeah, you're just like typical chump got sent down. Like, oh, yeah, yeah. you know what I mean. Like haters would love it. You know what I mean. Like, yeah. see, you thought you thought you were a badass. Yeah. You weren't. You no. know, like back here now. Um, and I, I mean, I, I think I had some uh, pretty good ones in the East Coast Hockey League, but I think that was the first year where I actually had like dropped some people. You know what I mean? Mm. Is there one that stands out in the AHL? 
Uh, there's quite a few, actually. I, I mean, uh, quite a few, especially that first year. There's a pretty, there's a pretty good uh, highlight film from that first year. And uh, so here I was, had a successful first year, showed up, battled. Um, they let me know right when the season's over, like, we're bringing you back. Mm. And that was a great feeling. Yeah, and you're scoring so, yeah. goals, too. So they, they um, give me a... They give me a contract for like um, sixty five or I don't know, like it was like it was not a lot of money. The twenty or the the twenty five game PTOs were I think fifty grand. Uh huh. Because you you know you had to pay certain things or whatever. And I think they offered me a sixty sixty five or seventy. I don't know whatever. Took it. Yeah. Like, oh yeah. Give me automatic. Here. Signed up right away. A month later, uh, after a workout, my agent calls me, you know, the people that take care of this for you, and they're just like, hey, you wouldn't believe it, but the the New York Rangers just offered you a contract. So when you sign a minor league contract, if you get offered an NHL when it supersedes that, so it's not like you're doing something scuzzy. Oh, gotcha. You can sign that NHL contract without feeling bad about that because they understand that if that comes, you can yeah. sign it. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's, that's life. They're not holding you yeah. back from that. But, you know, here I was. I had a wonderful first year. I love history. Every minute I got a chance to, I was in Boston. You know, it was like 45 minutes down the, mm-hmm. down oh, the whatever. Oh, you, you like the area. I yeah. love, because I'm, I'm a huge history guy, and I loved it. And yeah, my teammates old. were, so, it was like my first great post-college hockey experience. And, um, you know, I'm on Boylston Street. I'm in the museums. I'm in Cape Cod. I'm in Plymouth. I'm, you know, my, you know, it's my teammates. You're getting culture. Contracts, you know, like, you know, they're, they're buying these dinners. I'm not paying for them. <laughs> You know what I mean? I'm mm-hmm. pretending. Um, but I'm there. You know yeah. what I mean? And I'm kind of earning it. You know what I mean? Like, sure. you, you're damn right you're going to pay for it. Like, fuck, I'm the one kind of, you know, whatever, right? <laughs> you know? Like, mm-hmm. I don't let you get fucked with. That's like, right. you get the kind of whatever. So Thanks, buddy. Yeah. So I was all in. I love my teammates. You know? I never really learned this till like, you know, in, in, in real life, really, where you have to deal with change and personnel and things like that. It comes in sports when you, and you accept it. But still, I love my teammates. It was a no-brainer for me. So I call Ron Hextall and I said, hey, I just got offered a, a, an NHL contract by the New York Rangers. Um, I don't know what to do. I want to obviously come back and play for for you or whatever. And he's like, well, I expect you to. And I said, well, well, yeah, but they offered me a lot more money. And like they're telling me I might get called up. You know? And then he was quiet. Because, um, like, well, fuck, he doesn't, like, they're calling you up, you asshole. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah they told you that, but that's not fucking happening. Yeah, but you know it what could, I mean? Yeah, you, you got to <laughs> How do I and, uh, say but, this? But at the uh, end of the day, it was more money. Sure. And I was like, look, I live it at my buddy's house. You know? You know, I have a girlfriend that is in the world world, and she owns her own home, and here I am. I live at a friend's house, and so I'm constantly measuring myself, you know? Mm-hmm. And uh, he's like, well, I would tell you to do, uh, I would tell you to stick to your word. And I was like, <laughs> Of course you'd say that, coach. <laughs> I was like, I guess this is why you need an agent, you know. So I, my agent dealt with it. So long story short, I got a second year guaranteed from the Kings organization at a certain American League deal because you only get so many NHL contracts you can pass out. So their way of keeping me was give me a second year guaranteed for more money. So I stayed, right? Mm-hmm. Um, continued on that circuit. Uh, then there was a lockout in twelve thirteen where you guys saw Nate and Joey mm-hmm. and Timmy and Brandon and everybody come home and play for the Aces. Yep, yep. And I was like, mm-hmm. God, what, damn it! I, I want to go back home. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, oh, every, that. Everyone's coming to the games, and yeah. like, I get to be the monster. <laughs> oh. You know, everyone would be afraid of me. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> uh, you know, but that's not how it worked out. You kind of had to stay there because you never know if they needed you because you never knew when the league was going to start back up. Oh. But the league never started back up. That, well, it did, but not till January. Took a long time, yeah. Took a long time that year. Mm-hmm. So coming out of that year, you're like, all right, well, it's April, May. And I'm just like, well, I don't really play much last year. So I, is that it? Like, I'm looking at, you know, this person. I'm just like, well, like, if you want me to stay, you know, I don't want to get too much into it. But well, I need some kind of commitment for you or else I'm just going to keep looking at this. I should. I, I can't without you making commit commitment to me because yeah. they had a situation going on and they weren't really you know and, and, and i know now you don't just tell a female what to do you know what i mean mm-hmm. like and um so i ended up um signing with the uh, new york islanders 
and, and, and Bridgeport because Brent Thompson was an assistant coach. And this is during their rebuild, and they had a lot of young prospects. And the, the uh, goon that they had had some uh, injury problems. Mm. And, couldn't stay uh, on the ice. Couldn't stay on the ice, but yet he was wired hot enough to where he was getting suspended. Oh, wow. So they were just like, all right, well, we need to have, we need to have two dinosaurs out there. Mm. And uh, so they brought me in, paid me a, a reasonable fee or whatever. And it was good because I was like, man, I got another counterpart that's thinking the same way I am. He's not drafted. He's like me or whatever. And just one of the best human beings I've ever played hockey with. I mean, this is a guy where he was from Prince Edward Island. His name is Brett Gallant. And he was with his girlfriend and his newborn baby in a $50 a night hotel in Elmira, New York, trying to play hockey. Mm. This was oh, this was li- this was out of it. this was the guy that I was getting to play with this year. A guy yeah. that was literally fighting himself out of the closet. Yeah, yeah. So I was like, you know what, I can do this. And you know what? I think that him and I will be okay. Like, I know I'm a good dude, and I'm not encroaching on his opportunities because mm-hmm. here I am. I'm the th- I'm the one that's 32. He's 24, or 23. Yeah. And, you know, I'll do a good enough job of making sure he understands that I'm not trying to steal his thunder yeah, with yeah. the Islanders organization. If anything, I'm going to be the best teammate, support guy, and be what they want to be and, you know, go at this every night with, with two heavies. Yeah. Um, so you need to say, getting off the bus in Bridgeport is not, a, not fun mm. for a lot of teams because there was the two of us that were yeah. hungry and, you know, whatever. So, you know, going through the whole personal thing that year was kind of painful um just having to be conflicted about like here i am 32 years old like and i'm suiting up with a bunch of 20 year olds and my buddies are back home buying houses and buying boats and i'm just like you know i go home and i feel good about myself to a degree but i'm just like man i'm getting no work the other day i don't got no money in the bank i don't Mm -hmm. own a i don't own a home and um you know Still kind of scratching for that yeah, um, hockey career. Thing. Yeah, and I'm just like, what am I doing? Like, I'm staving off reality just for, for what? To, to go to be a babysitter? You know, I'm, nothing's promised to me doing this. If anything, it's just in, injury and, and uh, ridicule or embarrassment. And um, so I fought that a lot, and it kind of it ended up turning me into more of a uh, more aggro, I guess you would say. Mm. Well... Um, Started turning into an old codger or what? Yeah, I just <laughs> was like, you know what? like <laughs> Grouchy or what? <laughs> this is me, and I think the energy that I had next to me, where I really felt like I had a true companion in this. Counterpart. That wasn't a jerk. You know what? He, we had a... Uh, he just, I mean, just like supported me, mm. and I supported him. And before you know it, like he's called up to the NHL. And then all of a sudden I get called up to NHL, you know, and how that happened was just, you know, like, this is who we are. Like, you know, referees loved and hated us and and the whole thing. But like, um, you become, you find a way to become an entity, you know, just like we're going to keep the game a certain way. We are going to, um, keep things honest. Uh, we're going to respect the game. Um, we're going to take care of these teams' prospects because that's ultimately what it, it's all about. Like in the NHL, you don't see these guys roaming around anymore. Yeah. But, in the, but in the minor leagues, like when these teams are pulling into Binghamton or Utica, New York, or mm. you know, Wilkes-Barre, Scranton, or whatever, and they're from Europe or whatever, they're 20 years old, and they think they're God's gift or whatever. Uh, but then you got like a 28-year-old guy with a huge beard like you, but he's six foot whatever, and he's growling at him or whatever. Like you don't want to play. Yeah. And so you need to have guys the to them. hold them at bay to yeah. allow the game to, to function as it will so yeah. players will develop. So you, if you don't have that element, these guys will not play. They just won't. It's a great way to break that down. And, and, that's what, uh, and we can keep breaking that down and because it's really a thing. I, I always wondered yeah. what was the what – was, what was behind an enforcer or a um, – an intimidating force. Uh, I, I obviously just kind of knew hockey was like a yeah. physical, tough, yeah, almost at times gladiator-ish yeah. type yep. sport. But what was the point of the enforcer? And I guess when you start breaking it down to development, like the kind of like 
blows my mind. I had no idea, but it makes sense. It it was organic in the fact that you 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 accepted that you were not the six foot seven guy. Mm-hmm. So I was like, okay, well, I'm the uh, five foot ten guy that is just you know doing the work off the ice, weight training or whatever, MMA or whatever. But then, like, hey man, like I'm not going anywhere. And that I think that's a that's a mm. I don't know how to describe that. Like a roadblock. Um, yeah. Like we're mm-hmm. trying to, I want to come in here and I want things to be nice and easy or whatever, but you're sitting there and you're not going to allow me to just kind of come in and have my way. That's a thing. Um, so then you had to find a way to overcome that and be like, no, no, no. Hey, like I'm not intimidated. We're going to have our time and I'm not going to stop, you know? And if you do something, I'm going to do it 10 times worse. Do you believe it or do you not? And if you don't, I'll find a way to make you believe it. You know what I mean? All within the confines of the game without hurting the team or whatever. And you do that with, you know, verbal or, you know, certain mannerisms. Yeah. You know, and. um, You instill fear. Yeah. By being unpredictable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, a lot of guys, we called them sleepy. Where it's like they fought when they had to fight. Yeah. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, But they miss out on all those like little yeah. opportunities. Yes. And so you do that by not moving your feet and being able to body check. Like if you can't get your feet moving and hit somebody hard, then you're not forcing that guy to come out and deal with you. You know, so if you're that guy that's, you know, drafted and thinks he's something or whatever, and you got Mr. Try Hard JJ over there, and he's going out of his way, and he ain't he ain't making a difference, you know what I mean? Like, no one's scared. You ain't hitting nobody hard or whatever. Mm-hmm. But if I come out there, and I'm, like, in the goalie's face, I'm talking to your best player, I'm screaming at him, I'm sticking people in warm-ups, I'm taking yeah. pucks, I'm doing, like, he's just like... <laughs> <laughs> I can't let this slide. If I, don't go, if I don't go out there and fight this dude, like, I'm not going to have a job. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I did little things to make sure it had to happen. And if you didn't, then you were in trouble. Agitating. And chances are, last time we, next time we play, you weren't going to be there. They were going to find somebody else to call up and, yeah. and try to deal with it. And um, so I think through that, um, that support that I had that year, it showed up and, and um, I got the miraculous opportunity that um we dream about and uh what's that phone call let's let's get into that it was uh, a situation where everybody was getting hurt you know end of the year um non-playoff bound team and at that time of year anybody out of junior or aging out of junior in college teams are bringing in to give them these mini little um a interviews or tryouts if taste you will. of it who do we want to give a contract to next year or whatever? And a lot of guys get slaughtered or pushed down and pushed out of the lineup. Definitely guys like me. Um, Cause we want, you know, we're, what are we plan for at this point? Let's see what this guy can do. Mm-hmm. So, um, and I, and I love kind of having these conversations cause I get to kind of go back and things that I don't think about ever, you know? Yeah. Um, hindsight. And trying to relive these things. Cause these were things that were things that you should really, um, you know, take with you yeah, every yeah day when it tight. comes to mm-hmm. dealing with adversities that we deal with we're dealing with people and here we are in 2022 so ready for it it's april uh, i'm waiting for the coach to kind of tell me i'm not playing tonight I had a really nice coach uh that I, I felt like cared about me and respected me but he always had a tough time telling me i wasn't gonna play and i don't know why because i never gave i never like snapped on him or i was like fuck you or like fuck this is bullshit would coaches be afraid too they they were yeah. You know, and there's some stories I could tell about that too. Yeah. You know, um, I remember the first time I stood up to a coach, and I'll tell that story too, but. Uh, um, this is some scary shit. Yeah, I mean. So, <laughs> like, yeah. so I'm, you know, I'm in, uh, I guess I'll tell that story first before I tell the call up story, but we had a weird warm up fight in Worcester, and uh, it wasn't my fault. You know, I had a middleweight guy on my team that liked to stir shit up, and here we were at the end of the year, and he was like, you know, wanted to kind of, you know, he's a young guy and wanted to kind of have his thing and so it turned into an all-out thing in warm-ups <laughs> you know what i mean yeah. and we were the team that was definitely not the heaviest team um and 
we were trying to go to the playoffs, and here we are, and it, we had this big, huge brawl. And obviously, I got the best of the guy, and you know, hit him with a hammer over the top, and it was over. And coaches are out there, and it's on YouTube or whatever. We get in the locker room. <laughs> I'm sitting there, and I'm just like, I'm just kind of, I'm kind of mad at Dicky. I'm just like, Jesus, man, like, I don't know what's going to happen, but I, I had that feeling like something was. Gonna, I wasn't going to play, and we weren't going to get the penalty minute fighting major lead or whatever. Coach comes in, and usually when when I'm in the lineup, it's the four different line combinations and my number is the fourth one on one side mm. and then if i'm playing that one guy gets scratched out and then i'm in he comes in the locker room grabs the eraser he erases my number and fucking throws it and uh, Dickie's like no coach that was my fault like that was me or whatever and he's like damn it and i'm just like what and i'm like what the f-? you know because for me, that was a big deal to kind of have the penalty mitts lead or fighting majors lead. And I was like, it was being taken away from me because coach thought I was an asshole. Yeah. You know? And I'm like, that's not what I did. What, I did what you motherfuckers pay me to do. Yeah. You brought me here. Jesus. Yeah. Because that's because if had I not done something, you would have been a lot more mad at me. Yeah. You know, and uh, the freaking kick a trash can, you know, across the locker room. You know what I mean? Uh, throw my skates off and I'm walking down the locker room or I'm walking down the hallway in Worcester. And I love this coach, love him. And uh, he's like, "You better settle down. I swear to God, I'll send you down so fast your freaking head will." Just some typical old di- old dude stuff. Yeah. And I was just like, "What? Do you think that I'm normal? Like, what you expect of me is not at all like what we expect out of human being you want me to do certain things and you know what i'm I'm gonna carry a little bit of uh emotion here with me don't talk to me like that ever again and he looked at me and he was like okay and that was the first time my whole life i ever talked back to a coach and he'll say i took my whole gear i walked down the hallway walked downtown worcester at like 2 30 in the afternoon i was in my equipment pulled up to a bar people probably thought it was halloween and ordered one of like some kind of blue moon juice thing and i was sitting there drinking a drink because i was you know having to whatever decompress um but you know back to the 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 call-up thing um yeah i tell that story because it was just like it was just an unfortunate incident and on the whole thing. And I thought here I was doing, what I was supposed to be doing all of a sudden I was in trouble and I was getting flack for it or whatever. But, um, you know, I go back to that, that morning where they're like, uh, JJ, go see the coach. Done this before with Manchester or whatever. Yeah. You know, the, you know, I'm the get, ropes. I'm getting, uh, you know, scratched. So I go sit down in the coach's room and the two coaches, the three coaches are there. And the one coach, Boganicki, who played with me with the Aces, he's just sitting there and he's just smiling at me. I'm like, man, that smile's weird, dude. Like, when we like, you know, something. Like, is that how? It, is that where? I've, is that where it's come to? Like, I'm just like a clown. Whatever, I'm not playing. Like, okay, that's not. You know, it's like whatever. He's just smiling at me, you know, just in his chair. And uh, the coach goes, "Hey, um, Johnny, I just um, just want to make sure you know, like, you know, keep." whatever but um you're not gonna play tonight and i'm sitting there you know in my undergear and i'm just like okay like you know, i've been preparing myself for this all morning and he goes um um need you to uh, get your clothes back on go home and grab a suit as soon as you can and uh, drive to new york because you're gonna play against the devils tonight and i was just like what and he's just there just staring at me and I'm just like and I'm just like wow just a kaleidoscope of uh, and I'm sitting there and I'm just like okay that's not funny you know um, <laughs> because they're such dicks <laughs> you know because it's not you know like no longer friend. you know you, you get treated like at that point you get treated a certain way like you know because they expect you just to deal with it and handle it and they don't want to have to handle you with kit gloves and sometimes he would kind of overdo it because he thought i would you know but he didn't realize how much i respected him and i would never you know be demonstrative at him and and they just stared at me and i was just sitting there like i didn't believe it yeah and uh Bogey's like, what the fuck are you doing, man? Like, you're going to play in the NHL? Like, you got nothing to say? And uh, I was like, for reals? No. 
I was like, uh, um, okay. Um, I'm like, no, you, you, you need to, um, you need to go home as fast as you can, <laughs> you know, because they do this, they do this at a certain time for a reason, you know, to put you on a roster for the day. Yeah. To, to, to make there's, the line up and the there's whole a, thing. There's a paperwork thing. Mm -hmm. And like, you still got to get through New York city traffic, you know what I mean? To whatever, to, and, um, and I got out of the locker room and when I got in the locker room, all my teammates were in the hallway, you know, they all knew. Yeah, they all knew because they knew somebody was going up. Yeah, because they, you know, everybody, every prospect, is, you know, they they watch that. You can only have twenty three guys in the active roster, and as soon as somebody gets hurt, someone's getting called up. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, what I mean, you got other guys that are interested that other guys that are injured that are not definitely going, not definitely going down. So they know someone's going up, and uh, we we're coming out of the coach's office, and everyone's in the the hallway, and I see my bag and my sticks taped ready for me, and they're just like, right, just like. Yeah, you know, buddy. Clapping at You're me. Earn this. They're just like, good for you. You know, and some of those guys were a little fuck. A little salty. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> yeah. But they couldn't show it. And, right. Uh, right. I remember uh, you know, got my, you know, gear and, and, and Louis, I mean, I don't know if he remembers he has this distinction. He was the first person I called. Because, mm. you know, I used to run on this dumbass treadmill at Elite. I shouldn't say dumb, it's a great treadmill. <laughs> Um, Many hours on that yeah. trip, <laughs> or you'd stare at the jerseys of all the guys that played in the NHL. Yeah, <laughs> oh, he used to love to tease me, like, "Well, I don't know if that'll be you up there ever." Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know yeah. And, the hell uh, it is. Yeah. He, yeah. Was, he was, he was <laughs> yeah. the guy you have. One. Turn this up to ten. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Jack it up. <laughs> yep. Yours is there now. And uh, now he so I don't, I don't know where. The fuck it better be Louis. Lot. You better put yeah, that yeah, thing Louis, up Louis's there right now. Figure that out, Louis. He Billy, left Billy's supposed to be late now, but yeah, Billy, put it up there. So uh, call him, tell him it's going down, and and uh, I get to um, get to Long Island or whatever, where they have the town car waiting for me, and uh, Ron uh, Gar Snow is waiting for me uh, inside the building by the elevator, and uh, the first thing I knew to say was like, Mister Snow, um, I'm going to light a candle for you. Um, for the rest of my life, You're like wow, like you know, I didn't know what to say to him, but I was just so I didn't, you know, that's what came out. Yeah, that's yeah. what came out. He goes, you know, normally this is this is not um, common practice, but I just want to have a conversation with you. Um, I said, okay, okay, all right. So we go down and I grab some stuff that they want me to carry with me. Um, he goes, hey, um, really respect Lou Morello. Um, they got this thing going on right now where they've got Yager and. L.A. Osh is retiring, and, and uh, Brodeur is retiring, and you're going to play tonight. I don't want you to do anything, you know, because for me, like, I'd play six to eight minutes a night, and it was all about just being an animal, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. just, you know, having fun with it, you know, chest bumping people and laughing at them, like, you're not going to do nothing, you know, just like it was it a joke. They would slap shot some nights, <laughs> and he, I think he, that was his way of being like, this is the NHL. Don't be, play hockey and respect the game and, and uh, you know be with the flow thing. It's not something that you don't get. Like, you know how to play hockey. I was like, yes, okay, y y yes, I do. And, and um, so I get in the town car. We're going through Manhattan or whatever, trying to get through New Jersey. And I remember I just had to pee so bad. I hadn't eaten or whatever. And the guy was like, man, I can't pull over for you to go pee. You know? Oh, you asked him? Yeah, I was like, I need to pee. I have to pee. Because I thought that's what I needed to do. I was, be, I was drinking Gatorades the whole way through the bridge, Throg's Neck Bridge or whatever. Yeah, getting hydrated. That's the one thing I was, I was getting hydrated. I hadn't eaten pregame meal. You know, I hadn't even thought about it. And uh, so he was like, all right, well, uh, I'm going to be on the street for at least another, you know, five, six blocks. Find a pub to go pee in. So I run out of the town car, go find a place, you know, New York City. You yeah. know, run down the stairs. You know, it's tight or whatever. And I'm just like, what the fuck am I? I'm going to play in the NHL. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And uh, get out, run down traffic, jump back in the town car, and, and uh, pull up to uh, the New Jersey Devils, Stuvril, New Jersey Devils uh, Stadium. And I, said, I had to put my suit on. So I had them pull over. Here I was in Newark, sitting on, this, on, this, on the sidewalk, putting my suit on, the whole thing, literally just to drive around the corner. <laughs> <laughs> get my suit on, drive around the corner, pull up, and there's two guys standing there with, like, khakis and a, and a blue shirt on. And before I can even get out of the car and grab, like, my travel bag, um, they've got my bag, and they're running down the hallway with it. You know, I'm like, wait, 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 you know, okay. So I'm walking down the locker room, and I'm just like, um, it's like 3.15, 3.20, and I was just like, hey, um, I haven't eaten yet today. 
So they get on the phone, and, and all of a sudden they're like, "All right, go outside. Security's going to take you to get something to eat." So I uh, go with the security guard to like a sky bridge to a, like a you know um, a uh, you know Chipotle. professional building or whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They've got Starbucks, you know, McDonald's, Arby's, or whatever. And uh, I get a a cold Arby's or a cold uh, Starbucks coffee, and I get a. A subway sandwich i'm standing there or i'm sitting there in a sky bridge eating it with a big ass security guard staring at me you know and i'm just like what's going on like this is, just <laughs> this like, is bizarre <laughs> you know and um by the time i get to back the rink the team is there and everybody's so happy to see me and um here here it was it was i was gonna play in the nhl gonna take the ice the rink, the ice is literally like crumbling beneath me when I'm on it, you know, and you're just, you feel like you're in a fishbowl and like you're like, remember, you do know how to skate and like shoot the puck, you know, <laughs> pass like, and just all the, you know, like you still have, to, you still have to function within the team warm up. Um, then, uh, before you go to, onto the ice for the real thing, they're just like, Hey, uh, what did Garth tell you? Tell me what Garth told you. He said, nothing coach. All right, let's go have fun. <laughs> First period, we're out there, and uh, Capuana goes, all right, we're going to roll. And uh, we're like, okay. And I'm sitting there, and I'm just like, what the fuck does that mean? We're going to roll. <laughs> like, I think I know. I, I'm pretty sure I think what that know, but that, that definitely doesn't talk about me. Like, you know, we're going to roll. And I go, hey, Brent, like, what's that mean? He goes, we're just going to we're just gonna go one through four. We're going to play. And I'm like, we get to play like two shifts a period, you know, in the American. Like, we're, you, you mean we're going to play like a regular shift? And he's like, yeah, yeah, we're going to be okay. He's That's like, trust awesome. me. He's like, he's like, trust me. It's way easier. Because you had your one buddy there. Yeah. He's yeah. like, trust me. It's way easier. Everyone does what they're supposed to do. You'll see. <laughs> <laughs> when you get the buck, somebody will be there calling for it. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You know Nobody's what I mean? has got an agenda. And, like, when when you're ready, <laughs> and when you're ready for it, it'll be on your stick. You know what I mean? And... Uh, so play like a regular shift, got a few shots on goal, like accidentally almost scored once. <laughs> <laughs> um, got on the team flight to Buffalo after the game. Um, they go, do you want the chicken or do you want the steak? And I'm sitting next to uh, Thomas Hickey, who I played with in Manchester, who obviously was super excited that I was there. And So I'm sitting there next to him, and, and I go, yeah, the steak. Yeah, of course, the steak. That thing sat there the whole time. I never even touched it. I was so excited, like – I couldn't eat. I couldn't bring myself to eat. I was just too excited. Land You're in on Buffalo. that flight with all those yeah, guys, all those talking guys. about the game, and yeah, and they don't mess around. Like it's not like we're gonna sit here for a while and then leave. Like it's like all right, when the game is over, like within like fifty minutes to an hour, like you're already out of the building, you know, especially yeah. out there. And so we landed. I want to say before, like easily before midnight or eleven thirty in Buffalo. What a big day for you, man! Yeah. So we're in <laughs> Buffalo. Go to the bar that everybody else goes to, and I'm standing there, and it's like, oh, I'm, I'm here. Yeah. There's, there's like you 30, have double shovel. Yeah, there's like, no, there's, like, there's like 32 Bud Lights on the counter, and um, there's just a bunch of girls just hanging out, and there's just a bunch of dudes here, and it's just like you know, the longer we're there, the you know, the more the interaction starts. And I'm just like, wow, this is like, wow, this is real. Like, this is you know. I guess what it's like. I wasn't, you know, pretending to be that at all. Yeah. Um, so wake up, have a practice there at Buffalo on Saturday. and, and hold, hold on a second. So I have two things here. So when did you find out you're going to play the next game? Because you ended that game. You're probably like, oh, do I get to play again? There was a lot of staff with the, with the team. And after the game, um, Brett had had his fights. You know, because he got called up a few days before I did. Yeah, yeah. And staff was like, it's going to be your turn on Sunday, big guy. Ah. Oh, so they had like the three game plan. <laughs> yeah, three. and I was like, oh, okay. Well, that guy's six foot seven <laughs> or six. Okay. Nine. Oh, here, you already, here, you already here, have here, here goes to the second, my second thing. Yeah. So, um, heck, man. So what year was that? 2014. Okay. So 2012, Chris Schnell's birthday downtown sunny day me and you run into each other yep. at the party of course and we're talking for a while and i was asking how i was going you're like man i need a sharks tryout mm -hmm. and i was like why and you're like because i'm gonna show them i can fuck up john scott mm -hmm. 
and then now you tell your story. Yep. You know, and I, at that point, I was just like, well, I, I wasn't trying to be too overconfident. When I was in the midst of like doing it during the season, I was like, well, you're looking at these guys that are playing up ahead, and you're just like, well, they're not really like, you know, not 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 it's necessarily him, but you know. There's certain guys getting to play the role and getting called up. They're like, you know what? They're not really like doing doing the role justice, right? Um, and so that's something that me and Brett always would talk about on the mm-hmm. bus. Like, if we ever got to fight, we were gonna be throwing punches. Yeah, there would be no holding on. It would be all out, like, you know. Yeah, you're coming in on something's happening yeah you know what i mean good or bad like we're gonna be in a real fist fight like something that the 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 old old school would um appreciate Appreciate. yeah yeah ron (laughs) hextall would be like yeah that's my boy so (laughs) so all right you know I'm like, okay i'm playing sunday so i try to mind my business and um you know go through the you know the rigmarole on saturday and something happens that i can't talk about right now i'll talk about another time um but we get to Sunday, and all right, here we go. Um, playing a 5 p.m. game. Get in the locker room, and that same old sensation of anxiety yeah. mm-hmm. is there. Butterflies like, and jitters. Like, like this, I, this could go horribly wrong. You know, this could be bad, and then everyone will laugh at me. Mm-hmm. And they'll be like, this guy went out there, and it was embarrassing. Like, you know what I mean? Scott's going to be pissed because I had to think that Scott was like, all right, well, my buddy's getting called up. Like, he better. Yeah. He's, we're from the same high school, from the same era. Like, I can't get beat up. I just, I can't. Yeah. I cannot get beat up by this guy. I don't care if he's six foot nine, 270. Like, I just yeah. cannot. Um, you know, and, you know, the rest of my peers and the whatever, you know, people want to think like hey, you got called up and you you know fell on your face and it was a disaster and yeah, you're whatever like you get it like it just all that going through my head yeah and i had a uh friend named jim blackshire who i'd work with his kids it was my I, pastor yeah i sent Back him a text it's a true story you can go through my phone i sent him a text and i said jim my uh, dance partner tonight is six foot nine 270 pounds and he's not brand new Please pray for me. <laughs> I said that text genuinely, you know, and um, I did my same usual golf on my own, kind of try to settle myself down. And um, somebody came and got me from the other team. And they're like, hey, somebody w- wants to speak to you. So I go into the hallway, and it's the other team's head coach because I had played with his son in Manchester, and he was just like, I'm probably not going to see it to the game, but I want you to know that me and my wife are super proud of you, and, and uh, Jordan Nolan and his son are, are just, uh, you know, appreciate everything you did for him, and we're just so glad that you're going to get to realize your dream tonight. And uh, just do me a favor, don't don't try to fight John Scott, because, you know, I want this to be good for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're like, thank you, bud. Yeah, and I was just like, I was like, but, man, you, you saw me take care of these tall guys it's actually easier for me you know and he's like i know but you know we had a rough night last night in boston he was super pissed and we're at home tonight and uh, you know obviously he would love to just you know go out on a high and and, and you know basically beat you up you know to end the yeah. season he's like try to get see if you can you know if you're gonna fight somebody just try to fight somebody else and i'm just like everybody expects me to fight him yeah you know, because I had proven myself to be that guy that was, you know, could take on the, the bigger guys. The heavyweight. Uh, and I'm just like, okay, I didn't know how to feel about that, you know. Like, it was in my head a little bit, but, you know, whatever. Like, I got Brett here with me, and, you know, everything is so positive. And I'm sitting in the locker room, and I, I go to the, 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 the conditioning coach or trainer guy, and I go, give me everything you got. I had him whip me up every single energy drink slash whatever, and I just chugged it all, and, and I was just like, because I hadn't really eaten. Oh, you know, I was didn't so have an appetite. I didn't have an appetite because I was so mm-hmm. amped, high off the whatever. Yeah. Yep. And um, so in the locker room, I remember looking up because there had something that happened the night before where everybody was just so in, like in awe and enamored with like, who the fuck is this guy? And someday when I'm not working for a company, I'll, I'll tell you. But then <laughs> um, my phone's going off. And uh, this guy's like Todd Christensen. I'd be like, you going to fight the big guy? Yeah. Are you going to fight the big yeah. guy? And I'm just like, you know. Yeah, just, yeah. You <laughs> Stop know, talking about people it. People are texting me, and I'm sitting next to Brett. 
and uh, I remember him just kind of like take his hand, you know, that, 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 that male um, affection. Yeah. He just put his hand on me. He's just like, just patted me on my knee pad. Like, Hey, I'm with you, man. Like, have a good one. Yeah. And I was like, I guess it's my turn. Yeah. You know, this is what I've always wanted or whatever. So, uh, it's time to go in the rink. And, um, if you've been there a while, you get to skate without your helmet and pretend that you're a rock star. Mm-hmm. you know oh, okay but if you're new to the thing you wear your damn helmet you know and i'm just like yeah i'm wearing my helmet like you know brett and i because we're both honest dudes that you know whatever we get it and the uh, mainstay big tough guy uh karkner he's like you guys are like you guys are gonna do this right and we're just like no 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 we're, we're gonna wear a helmet it's like they're gonna think we're the biggest pretenders and assholes ever like we're gonna wear a helmet grabs my helmet off my head and throws it across the locker room and i look at britain i'm like well i guess we're not wearing our helmets <laughs> step on the ice i'm like what am i i'm out here in the nhl like no helmet on <laughs> Buffalo, new york like so give me the puck let me snap it in the net you know what i mean as long as i don't miss <laughs> but then wait a minute what's my usual you know my usual is to go to the red line and make sure that they know i'm there that was my thing like, yeah i go uh, stretch at the red line like hey just in case you were wondering I'm in the lineup. I'm here now. I will you know be I mean? out there. I'm in the lineup. <laughs> and that's and John Scott's usual, Yeah, that's too. John Scott. So I, I see him, and I kind of inch. I say, hey, man, like, I don't mean any disrespect. I don't mean any disrespect. Trust me. But just so you know, like, you and I got to fight today. He's like, oh, yeah? You know, here he is. You know, he's a seasoned guy. He's just, yeah. you know, he's probably just trying to get through his last Sunday of the year. Like, he's a dad, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. You know, like, I think he's a mechanical or engineer, by the way, too smart guy and i go yeah no we we like definitely like like it's expected like that that you and i fight and you can see it in the, in the video yeah he's i know like, i've he, always he, wondered where you guys were talking he's about. like he's like uh my coach said that he likes you too much <laughs> he does not want me to see does not want me to beat you up <laughs> i said my coach told me my coach told me he likes you too much and does not want to see me beat you up wow <laughs> and i was like I, I didn't know how to like come back I, I i didn't know how to like come back to that and i was just like well hey john like i don't know what, i don't know what else to tell you but like every time we're in the ice i'm gonna be on the ice and i'm gonna be trying to fight you the whole damn time and he's just like oh yeah you know and he's like why don't you try to fight kanopka like big now then he was kind of like just like encouraging me to go a different direction like you yeah. sure are you sure yeah maybe it's because he half respected me i don't know you know he's like are you sure why don't you and i go no one wants to see that everybody on my team wants to see me fight you that's what's expected like that's what's happening <laughs> and i go like, yeah he goes and he's yeah. all right you know yeah. and um uh, so you know go back in the locker room it's time to play and i'm just like jesus christ am i ready for this you know and i'm trying to remind myself the whole time like this is not new this is there's nothing new here it's establish your balance bend your knees get your hands up get a hold of the guy stand up and try to win the fight you know just like you have been you know early on i wasn't very good at it you know coming out of ua and uh you know but you know by then i had you know trained and and yeah. um, you knew what i was doing you've seen a lot of youtube videos yep and seen a lot of youtube and, and, and a lot of real life. shout out to carl yeah and lived it myself <laughs> and a uh, shout out to uh, um i can't believe i just forgot his name um afc guy um it's got a brother service guys um bad neck um worked at gracie baja he was my luke rambert oh um that guy put in some real time with me oh really real time um we would go at it for a good four to six weeks and this guy you know i'm paying him 30 40 bucks a session and he was so invested in that hour he had with me you know could have been because he knew me i don't know whatever it was like that guy gave me his all and push me and i had a hard time getting home like i'd be on my dodge my baby dodge dakota you know with my head on the steering wheel trying to get home i was so like he would just completely crush me you know with these workouts at gracie baja on off international like i'm ready you Mm -hmm. know 
I'm, I'm ready. Like, just like, come on. Like, you're ready. Uh, the game starts. Both teams non-playoff bound. We're going to go 1-1, 2-2, 3-3, 4-4. Like, we're going to roll them. It's going to be, you know, it's going to be an NHL hockey game. Mm-hmm. You know, both teams trying to win, but, you know, we're not trying to win the Stanley Cup here. And, uh, you know, third team goes out there and they ice the puck. And so we get to change. They don't. And normally the coach will say the center's name, you know, um, you know, Homo, Brent, whatever, like up. They ice the puck and I swear to God, he fucking came down and he kicked me in my back. All right, Johnny. Here we go. And then Doug Waite right behind me fucking punched me in my shoulder. (laughs) (laughs) Go get him. Nothing to do with the fucking game. Do you know what I mean? Like, here it is. Like, this is the best time that you're ever going to have in life. This is literally the best time you're ever going to have in life to show up. Like, here it is. It's 0-0. Nothing's happened. Clearly, he's going to be on the ice. You're going to be on the ice. There's no better time. Get it. You know what I mean? He's not going to have an excuse. You're not going to have an excuse. Here it is. All right. Get on the rink. Go down to the, the, you know, take the face off. And I'm just like, just, it's almost that weird nausea you get when you're not, you don't have the stomach flu, but you're just like, you know, you feel funny. And uh, they ping the puck out of the zone. And I, I come up the ice and. Kanopka gets on and he goes, yeah, Johnny. And I go, no. And John Scott's sitting there. He's so tall that his ass is on the boards and his feet are on the ice. And I go, no, Scott, like, no, like I'm screaming. No, no, Scott, let's you and I, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And he's just like, <laughs> <laughs> he's so he's, he's completely annoyed. Take my gloves off. Normally I, I do a good job of shedding them to where they're away. I'm so nervous. They just fall. I'm just like you're not gonna let a glo- you're not gonna slip on your gloves. So I took an extra second to, you know, yep. get that out of the way. Yeah. And uh, I hear Brent like, "All right, JJ, here we go," you know, and everything's quiet. And uh, I grab onto the guy and kind of stumble a little bit. Establish that I've got a good kind of you know grip with him. He kind of throws those kind of half-hearted punches over the top. Quick little jabs. Quick little jabs. And, you know, for a guy that's smaller, you know, that's all we need is to get underneath somebody that's tall Mm -hmm. and just hold on. Get your leverage. Just hold on. You know, hold on because this doesn't hurt. You know what I mean? Like, you get with a guy who's bending his knees and is rotating into punches and is a little more dynamic on his feet, you know. But you fight a guy who's over 6'4", 6'5", they're a little more upright. And kind of get in there, and I kind of give a few back. And I can, you know, I hit him in the side of the neck or whatever. And then, you know, what happens is naturally is you, you begin to panic, you know. And, you know, you never want to circle into someone's power, mm. right? You always want to circle away from it. Yeah. Mm. You know what I mean? Okay. You know, you should be chasing your target rather than your target coming into you, right? Does that's he just, know he's... That's just basic. He knows. He knew. He um, knew you were a lefty? He, he definitely knew. Um, you know, I'll let him... Tell people that he, he didn't know, but he yeah, got, yeah. Nick Delorier was my teammate in matches for three years. Uh, he he yeah, definitely yeah. knew. So, um, but it changes when you're people throwing punches at you. It's kind of tough to kind of maintain yeah, that yeah. kind of thing. And so he just kind of came into my plane and made the dis shorten the distance for me. Yeah, and uh, just. Like a skyscraper. Can we watch this right now? Yeah, it's let's beautiful. put it on. Yeah, yeah, it is yeah. beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we're gonna put it on here real yeah. quick. Um, Justin, I was watching it, dude. And what's What's that one you got on there? Uh, what's it? Justin Johnson's TKO's John Scott. Or you can go Justin versus John Scott. Justin Johnson. Yeah, that that'll that'll work too. What were you guys saying when you guys were on your knees stretching? Like you guys are super close. Yeah. Like you look like you're pretty pissed off. I don't. I was. Well, I was trying to. I was trying to. There we go. Make sure he understood that I was very serious. You know, oh, this video may be inappropriate yeah. for some users. <laughs> <laughs> well, I understand, and I wish to yeah. proceed. <laughs> There's Brett Gallant right there. I'm gonna turn it up. Yeah. Oh, you moved the oh, glove. There, there it is. is. Yeah. Um, yeah, like he knew. He knew what he was getting into. Yeah. The way he's stancing yeah. up on you. He's scared too. Yeah. I swear. I mean, I don't know. Oh, yep. You see right where here. you see where I'm grabbing him though. Yeah, like, right here, right here. Boom. Oh, oh my God. 
and I don't know if you guys ever do oh. that jujitsu stuff, but when someone grabs you a certain way, mm-hmm. and I had trained for that, you mm-hmm. know what I mean? Like, you know there's no getting out of it, and it's just like, a, you know, you're like you're riding a bull. Right. You know. Oh, this is the beginning. Yeah. I was like, and I, here I am just like, oh, I don't know what you're talking Like, come on, man. Like, yeah. And he's like, are you sure? Oh, my God, dude. <laughs> and, uh, Did you say yeah. something to him right there? I said, God bless you. <laughs> I said, God bless you. Oh I said, God bless you. God. I, I actually knew all the refs. <laughs> I actually knew all the refs, the linesmen. And what did Coach say after? Because, you know, he didn't so want I, you to fight him. What? So I, I, it's over, and I'm like, God bless you. Because in my head, he didn't have to do that. Yeah, you, you know, can kind of tell at the end he's he like, could, fuck, He, he could have got away with pretending like, man, my hands hurt or blah, blah. I'm not messing with you. And, and he gave me that opportunity. And um, the linesman looking at me and just like. What? <laughs> you know. Ah, I the fuck um, that was like, that was the most awesome thing anybody had seen that day kind of thing. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, like, yeah, they yeah. were just yeah. so happy to see it. Not at his expense, but it's just not what anyone expected. Yeah, you know they can, they expected me to kind of get punished and whatnot or fall or, or or try to bow out as gracefully as I could. They they didn't expect that and mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> and I look up and in between the penalty boxes is Rob Ray, who is an old time beauty, and I remember locking eyes with him and he just is holding holding his mic and he's just you know like nothing to say no commentary to give just like that's not what i ex- expected it was to breathtaking. Have. and even my teammates i think were caught off guard because they were quiet and they did the stick thing and like yeah i'm going to the penalty box and you see travis hamannick and he's like johnny you're a legend <laughs> <laughs> And he's going off of what just happened and what I just happened the night before, and and I said, "Buy me a Powerball ticket. <laughs> Buy me a Powerball ticket." And I get in the penalty box, and it's an old, you know, old dude. And he's like, "Wow, good for you!" Like, you know, whatever. And on the bench, you know, I've, I've told this story before, but there's no like backrest on the players' bench you're kind of you rest like at your upper hamstrings mm. and your heels touch the the floor you're like leaning forward but in the penalty box the bench is up against the wall and so i swear to god is my first instinct to push up against the wall and my feet were swinging <laughs> my feet were swinging and then i look up and it's music's playing and it's time to kind of get the game back going and i look across the rink and you could have sworn that I was in a high school game. It looked like a complete house party over there on the bench in the NHL. Like guys like banging with their boards and just doing this. <laughs> and just like smiling. Just whatever that sanctity was that was the NHL. Like had gone out the window that afternoon. Like, like that was awesome. Yep. They were so happy for me and so excited. And here I was, and I was like, I was like, what's going on with this this thing? Why is it so high, or whatever? Why like? And he was like, kid, like, relax, like, um, you're not tall, like you're short, like, I don't know, like <laughs> you know, New York guy. And I'm just like, okay, 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 okay. And I'm trying to relaxing or whatever. And pucks are coming, and I go, uh, give me that puck. I want that puck. And I stuff a puck in my pants. <laughs> I don't know why I did that. But I, I want a puck from this game. Yeah, well, I stuffed a puck in my pants, you know. <laughs> yeah, and I, and I actually sat there for the, you know the rest of the period, and I pulled it out, and uh, you know I remember looking at Brent Thompson, who was my coach of the Aces, you know, through the whole Aces Manarch thing, and he's looking at me just like, "That's right." <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, thank you for not letting me down. Yeah, mm. and uh, you know, like we all know, like it feels so good to show up for people. And, yeah, and not and 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 be what they needed us to be when they vouch for you. And that was a situation where I definitely um, didn't let somebody down that had given yeah. me a wonderful opportunity because without him, I wouldn't have been there. Right. And what, what position did he have? He was the assistant coach of the New York Islanders. Uh, okay. okay. Yeah. So that was like a moment close to his heart. Yeah. Yep. And um, what a cool inside scoop on something that 
a casual fan just saw and was yeah. like, or maybe <clears throat> I just saw it on ESPN highlights mm-hmm. or whatever, and it was just like, you don't know the backstory behind yep. some short moment in time. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Is that your last? Was that your last game? No, I I, I came back and for some other personal reasons and thought I'd be a hometown hero and that wasn't really a very good decision, but it worked out where I got to eventually go back to American League and finish off in fifteen sixteen. Oh, okay. And um you know it uh another lesson in loyalty and decision making, you know, that we all learn sometimes the hard way and whatever and I, I chose to kinda let certain entities kind of control things when they thought that well why would you do that when like we've been so good to you why don't you just kind of deal with us on your own level and i let the business kind of take over and and uh, no fault of my guy it's just the guy that they were dealing was just like at this point i don't like you owe me like you know what i mean kind of thing and misunderstanding and and, uh, i owe that guy garson of the world and Mm. um uh, he did nothing but change my life and and uh, you know I'm forever grateful. Yeah, forever grateful. And I, I do feel like I want certain people that you know we grew up with Daniel to to take part in that because I feel like I came up through an era of some pretty hard nosed, gritty realities where you had a certain part of town having to show up against another part of town and succeed, meet those challenges that you know whether it's socially economic kind of thing and. There's mm. this idea about east side versus south side or whatever and what we're made of and what you're not made of. And if you're not good enough, you're good enough. And it felt good to kind of, I get to be a part of that mm. story. Mm-hmm. Um, somebody from East Anchorage. That's success. Com- coming behind Scott and uh, doing something that you couldn't, you know, yeah. take anything away from. So, I love uh, it. I yeah. love it. I want to switch Ooh, gears. Story. I want to switch gears. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about uh, one of my favorite topics, mm-hmm. um, fishing. Yes. Mm. Um, we're going to the King Derby? Yes, we are. All right. Yes, we are. And last year, I think we did a little bit better than you. You guys yeah. did. Yeah. <laughs> you guys a, lot did better. Better. <laughs> a lot better. Mm-hmm. We got zero. <laughs> the, so the, much, so much so, you started talking bets right out of the gate. I'm like, oh, No, I came in. Oh, as soon as yeah. I recognized, I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm so take serious. These suckers money. <laughs> the, our boat was so unlucky that during uh, when the tide was going out and the big waves, these guys went and like kind of had a seat. And then, uh, and then I was watching all the poles alone. And then suddenly I got a hit. I thought I had this big old king on. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Then I thought I had a skate. Ended up being a halibut. Yeah. Yep. We and got the, the only biggest thing halibut in the derby. <laughs> <laughs> all day. No loons. <laughs> I wasn't a halibut derby, though. So no. I really I really think the captain's got to do a better. I think they do a good job, but I think they really got to do a better job of explaining the horsing that has to go on. Mm. Because... Um, you know, it's not like catching a rainbow trout, but like when you let the, the line go slack or, or, oh, or the line's yeah. too tight, you know, you've got the the ocean current out there or whatever. It's easy to lose that fish. Yeah. You know, um, and I've just thought over the years that like, you know, those captains that are right there over your shoulder, a little more intense than the next guy, you know, you're a lot more successful bringing that fish in. So you're saying like lots of tension in horsing? For me, I was just like, this is like, I'm I've been reeling for four minutes straight here. Yeah, like, yeah literally, yeah. I've been. You know what I mean? Like, I don't I don't feel like I've gotten anywhere. Mm-hmm. To them, they're just like that's their way of not losing the fish and maintaining some kind of slack, which you can yeah. explain better than I can. But you know, when you don't have that voice in your ear, yeah, like that, if, like that that fish is likely gone. Yeah, yeah. you're on your own. You're you know what I mean? That and. Um, I think the guy was shy because my boss was a Super Bowl champion and just a huge human being that had all the swagger in the world. And I think he didn't feel comfortable like telling him what to do. And so, (laughs) and then the other guy played in the World Rugby USA team, and and uh, we lost those fish because they were horsing them way too hard. You know what I mean? Just overly excited and trying to rip it in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think catching catching the king salmon in the ocean is just like, like just you're gonna have to you know buckle in you know what i mean and uh that's what i've learned because i love to be on the ocean 
You know, mm-hmm. you know, I'll bring two speakers with me. I'll bring two coolers with me. <laughs> um, you know, I vet who we're going with because the last thing I want to be out there is with someone who's like going to be, you know, someone we got to like just go down below and, you know, whatever. And we're, we're worried about so and so, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. like I'm, we're adults here, like figure it out, take your own mean or whatever and, and deal with it. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, like we're out, we're, we're clearly when yeah. the boat when the boat leaves, it's obviously not coming back. Yeah, yeah. you're gonna have yeah. to gut it out. <laughs> you know, um, and there's just nothing better than being on a boat with people that you care about and yeah. like, and and you're going out there trying to catch some fish, and you're on the ocean, and whether any direction you look at, you're just like, wow, you know. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's not given to you. It's not a given that you're going to catch that fish just because it hits yeah. your line. I think that's a huge reality. Um, Check, check for, yeah, for a lot of people for sure. when they're on those boats. Yeah. So what's the yeah, bet? That's given. What's the bet you want to make? <sighs> this is something that I'm so serious about. Like, I, let's hear, <laughs> let's hear, JJ. What you want to put on the table? Here's what we'll offer. <laughs> we, uh, we'll we'll offer you a day, um, all pa- all all or all day, and uh, deliver a 50 rainbow day on the Upper Kenai. Okay. That's that'll be our boats. Okay. If okay. we lose, is that you and like I, that and one? I, and I just got to pay for chair five on the way back. Chair five sounds good. Oh, yeah, yeah. We did that before. Yeah. After I almost killed myself. That's a damn good story. <laughs> <laughs> I love that story. I almost got killed on that trip too. Yeah. By a human. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I, I just, uh, I, I, you know, river, um, ocean, um, I think the people part of it just makes all the difference in the world. Uh, there ain't nothing like bringing up a good fish out oh, of yeah. the water. I mean, oh, they yeah. just say nothing like it, man. You know, that would be a good podcast, actually, floating down the Upper Kenai. Mm-hmm. Maybe us four, like on a Tuesday. Yeah, yeah we can. Tuesday we can in August, yeah. we can all uh, yeah. launch out at launch out of uh, Sportsman's and yeah, drift pull over, do a little cook off, yep. make it happen. Because the people, the people who and drive, the people who know, like they know that's not easy floating and catching rainbows. Oh. That is so hard. It's fun if you could successfully capture that. You know, and we'll do it, we'll do it with these speakers tied off to the side. Yeah, mm-hmm. just uh, these mics live. Can just go we live, do it? live from the hanging on the rail, yeah. live from the fourth bend. Yeah, <laughs> we'll, we'll go all in, literally. <laughs> Little muddy waters playing. <laughs> there you go. You know, uh, man, yeah. we're boys. We're running at three and a half hours here. Yeah. This has been really, really good. But yeah. I don't. Oh, it's flying. I want to end this um, kind of how we end a lot of them with a with a, like a quick fire. Yep. Quick fire questions. Um, there's going to be some questions. There's going to be some names. Um, no real hurry, like expand or just do a quick answer, whatever you you yeah. uh, you feel. Yeah. Um, or if first. you know or not. Yep. Um, total knockout numbers. Number. I would say at least ten. Who's your barber? Billy at uh, AK Fades. Bengals or Rams? Bengals. Salmon or halibut? Salmon. Beads or Dalai Lamas? Beads. Seven weight or eight weight? Eight weight. Why not? You got to go heavy. Childhood hero. No. My childhood hero, honestly, growing up was Scott. Because mm. um, I just like, wow, that, that's somebody right in front of me doing everything I would dream of doing. Um, so it's for sure Scott Gomez. All right. Um, that's in great. In terms of the world, you know, I would say, um, you know, you look at – Denzel Washington and Martin Luther King and Malcolm X and um, some of these historical figures that that meant something to people. Yeah, you know, um, they weren't perfect or whatever, um, but to see and acknowledge and learn about what they meant um, struck me. Um, uh, uh, but I, w- I, I, w- I would say that you know those those individuals and. Um, I know I'm missing, you know, other other athletes, uh, you know, Jim Brown and um, some of these figures that you just couldn't help but just want to be like a little, know a little bit more about kind of, you know, and you think about that mental toughness and how easy it was to react to negativity and you, you see how they handled themselves with such elegance and grace, you know, Jackie Robinson and Hank Aaron and, and uh, you know, I always was very fixated on 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 trying to tap into those emotions because i know for me 
when I was um, doubted or you know underestimated or whatever. I know what I I know what those emotions felt like, and it made me angry. Yeah. And here I am trying to grow up, and um, I understand more what it means to yeah kind of rise above and uh, not feed into negativity because that is what people feed off of. And I know that now. I didn't know that then, but it was something I was enamored with in terms of like I just can't even believe it. Yeah. You That's know. beautiful. So yeah. Yeah, well said, bro. Favorite teacher. Um <sighs> That's another tough one. I would say Mrs. Townsend, Scenic Park. <laughs> Because that's a teacher I never trifled with. Mm. Of all the teachers, I never, never, never trifled with. Um, I had a math teacher that you guys may know, Mr. Nelson, at East High. And uh, I remember, like, sleeping in the class. I remember him, like, flicking me, like, hey, um, where are you going to sleep, man? Like, just kind of a smart-ass guy. And he's just like, uh, I don't have a good answer for him. He's like, like, you have a D, dude. Like, what are you doing sleeping? Yeah. You know what I mean? I was just like, <laughs> You're right. You know what I mean? What am I doing sleep? You know what I mean? Like, you know, rarely people call you out. You know what I mean? And that's, I'll never forget him for that. You know, like you want to be a loser? Like, like. Yeah. Wake up. Yeah. Wake up. Like you got a D (laughs) like you got a, you got a hard D in this class. Like. You want to keep playing? This is who you want to be. Yeah. 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 Uh, You you think, you think you're that guy? You're not Scott Gomez. You don't get to fucking sleep in my math class. (laughs) We don't know where you're going. You you know. (laughs) Uh, Most inspirational coach. Um. I would say uh, Mike Hastings. Um, John Hill is right there with him. Um, I say Mike Hastings right now because I was playing in juniors and I didn't know what I had in front of me and I was being sat out again. Um, and I was just like, wow, am I, not, am, I not, am I not good enough? Like, what's going on here? And the game, I knew the game had started. And it was back when you could warm up more players that could play in the game. Oh. So when you come back in, they'd be like, hey, just like in the American League, like, you're not playing. Oh, you would warm up and not know for sure if you were yeah. going to? Yeah. Oh, dude, yeah. that had to sting. Yeah, because players get hurt in warm-ups or whatever. It's oh, better yeah. than pulling okay. somebody out of the stands. Okay. Yeah. You know, so you already had somebody warm or whatever. Um, and I remember taking my, untying my skates. Um, and uh, this guy, you know, the, with the badly uh, altered suit pants. Right in front of me, he was you know five seven five eight bulldog, and he said, "Hey, hey, stay with me, you know, stay with me, like don't quit, like, like basically, like I know this sucks. You're not playing, you you get it, um, don't quit, like mm. we'll see what happens." And I remember like the time he took to leave the bench when the game had already started to come in the locker room and make sure I was because I, I mean I wasn't like screaming and yelling and throwing things and crying mm-hmm. or whatever. Yeah, throwing a fit. Um, but he had cared about me and wanted to keep me engaged. Uh, so I, that was a moment that I'd never forget. And then uh, you know once I got to UAA, here I was with John Hill and, and looked at him like he was you know larger than life and he had the swagger and here he was giving me an opportunity to play college hockey and it was paid for. You know, not the first year, but, you know, after after that. And uh, I just had so much respect for him and so much admiration that, like, you know, that's who your coaches were. They were the key to your future. Yeah. And mm-hmm. um, so that's a tough call. All right. Scariest guy you fought? Um, I would say Pierre-Luc Letourneau LeBlond. Whew, that's Whoa, quite an that's name. He, uh... You know, 6'1", 220, 230 pounds, bent his knees, uh, didn't mind if the fight was 20 seconds or two minutes. You know, uh, heavy, uh, strong, didn't mind switching hands, and so I had to be prepared for that. Like, it was tough to make him uncomfortable. Yeah. And so that was a guy that I, I did not enjoy having to fight. Uh, the next guy would be Trevor Gillies because that was a guy that was so amped up Mm. so fired up that like you could not ig- ignore it. like this guy is just revved up ready to go like on a, on a level that i thought i was and he's just you know one step up there. one, one, <laughs> one step up and just a great dude and i'm still friends with him to this day uh, a guy you guys would love you know lives in georgia now but uh i would say a guy another guy i didn't look forward to because he was left-handed like i was mm. and uh 
just like some people just they just want to they just want to test themselves that way yeah you know and for a guy like that you know has been knocked out has clearly won and lost a lot of fights mm -hmm. and you could tell was willing for whatever and that's intimidating yeah yeah like uh, like reckless yeah yeah Oof. who's a guy you like a rematch with um Those are good Br questions brian Gr mcgratton was like the first guy that i fought where i was just like wow this is this guy's legit you know he's been in the nhl a long time the first time i think he really underestimated me and i think i caught him like in his temple and he fell or whatever and he got kicked out of the game because he threw his elbow pad off and the second time we fought i was just like he's definitely going to want to make up for the first time because it definitely didn't go well for him, you know, and it was embarrassing or whatever. And I definitely had that timid, like, careful um, stance. And I think about it now, I was just like, why would I have been so, you why, know. Why change what you I was, do? I was feeding into that, like, oh, someone wants to get back at me. And that was unusual for me. Mm. Oh. Like, someone wants to come back at me because they knew I whatever and this so you were in defense mode so when this person was definitely capable of getting back at me so i was tentative obviously it wasn't a complete debacle or whatever but i just remember like you know i could have definitely uh done better but you know that was another life lesson for me about just like stand your freaking ground yeah, play yeah. your take, game too take, yeah. take a deep breath you know what you're given and you know what you can take you know what i mean and uh let's go all right love it uh, a couple of names I'm going to throw at you. Uh, one or two words to uh, how you feel about them. Yeah. Matt Manfredi. Um, solid. And I would say um, wonderful in certain way. You know what I mean? Uh, Kyle Sellers. Warmth. Scott Gomez. Um. I would say greatness, trailblazer, belief, um, so talented he could carry it. You know what I mean? Um, I know you asked for one word, but, I mean, we were all sitting there watching to see what he could do. And, man, did he do it. Oh yeah, you know. Yeah, you nailed it. You nailed it with all four words. Yeah, yeah. like what he meant to uh, all of us, and and uh, the way he kind of carried us through. You know, seeing that as a possibility, I know for sure I would have never thought about playing in NHL. I was getting to work out and skate with Scott year in and year out. I was as a part of his circle, and I was wasn't in the NHL, but I was uh, exposed to it through seeing him and his approach and his commitment and professionalism um, and all the ways that he acknowledged me. Um, so, you know, I, I, I've understood this for a while that like when he stopped playing that people would kind of, let's just not like be aware of him or whatever, which is unfortunate, but um that's just life and you know years go by or whatever mm -hmm. but um i know that eventually you get to a point to where you got to start thinking about naming buildings and statues and, and what represents you know opportunity mm. and i think uh, that's another word that suits him that's opportunity mm. and uh sacrifice because mm. you know i don't know if he told the story of, of, of his family but you know you talk about his dad and his brothers and whatever and how they came across and made it to Alaska and, and uh, you know, um, provided and made their lives with their bare hands and they're, you know, getting up every day and working uh, in these conditions and, and, and how he did whatever it takes with him and Dahlia to keep him on the ice. And the common sense, the um, strength, the... Um, uh, Um, the awareness, I would say awareness, because there's wolves at your door. Everyone wants something from you and your son. And the way he was able to steward that, you know, mm -hmm. navigate that with him, and Scott got exactly where he needed to go. I don't think it really mattered in some senses because he was just, I mean, he was off the charts. Yeah. Um, magnificent at, like, what he could do on, on two skates. But, 
man, I just, uh, the, to me, uh, I hope that in the future, you know, as we're older or whatever, there will be some kind of um, solid acknowledgement of what it means to have opportunity, you know, and how it meets, you know, success and, and uh, you know, what it means to a community like Anchorage. Perfect. That's fair, man. Yeah. Jason Chris Chuck. Um, MacGyver. Mike Lee. Um, magnanimous. Oh, oh man. man. I like that one. Yeah. Magnanimous. Magnanimous. I love it. I uh, love it. He, a hard guy to dislike, but easy to fear. Yeah. You know, he has a unique, uh, um, uh, I would say, Aura. Beautiful person. Enchanting smile. Good guy. Gigantic hands. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah that too. <laughs> Among other things. It's like, oh my God. <laughs> mm-hmm. Fucking hammers on the end of his mm-hmm. yeah. wrists. JJ, man, <clears throat> thanks for coming out. If you guys are uh, looking to follow Justin, it's uh, AKJJohnson49 on Instagram. Definitely uh, give his YouTube. Um, a look just justin johnson verse and it'll probably all pop up mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. thank you for your history your persistence your endurance um your ability to fight through all the uh tribulations and the barriers and boundaries that maybe people put around you mm-hmm. that you were able to strive through and, and punch through and fight through and over and over to become a, a real um inspiration yeah. to a lot of people that realize that you know what actually hard work can achieve greatness yeah. you know so appreciate you and, and thank you for your history in alaska and and your ability to be a role model is what you are um mm-hmm. to a lot of the kids coming up um your coaching and uh your thoughts and your opinions on on hockey and and what could be better and just in general thank you for your for being awesome and being you well i, I want to thank you daniel um you know there was a time when you and you and josh and everybody was kind of you know, trailblazing the uh, music scene here, and I remember seeing that. And uh, just a bigger picture, you guys were were um, were, were going for. And uh, that was the same time when you know Choku Charlies and and uh, <laughs> Rum Runners and whatnot. And you guys were doing your shows and and just unapologetically. And uh, you know, I saw that. You know, I witnessed that. Um, you know, Jack. You know, we we, we have a unique. We have a unique uh, background, and yeah. I just re- I appreciate just uh, just your ease and just how cool and and, and comfy and kind of how you take things in and, and uh, you're somebody I would tell my deepest darkest to you know what I mean without feeling uh, judged or or whatnot and just uh, knowing that what you are giving me in return is going to be valuable and uh, I feel like I, I I feel like I try to do a good job of of, of expressing that to you every time I see you. You, you do know? a good and, damn good uh, job. And uh, I just want you to know that you know you know we we, sh- we share we share a moment that uh, you know I got to see some real life parenting from your dad as well, um, <laughs> you know, and uh, that was that's some real stuff. Yeah, and uh, just know that you're, you're somebody I have, I have so much respect for. You know what I mean? Just uh, out here, kind of doing what you want to do, and, and you've made some tough choices. And and uh, Brandon, getting to know you, and I'm I'm super looking forward to kind of. Just uh, seeing how you guys can uh, are fitting this in because when I when I came in here and, and I'm 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 um, you know acknowledging what you guys are trying to do and, and I'm here you know working here in Alaska side by side with you guys and we're we're trying to do the best we can and I'm acknowledging just how hard it is to kind of keep your edge yeah you know and you've got we've got this whole world and this whole uh, uh, thing that is Alaska to go tackle and uh, you know I just love how you guys are, just aren't sitting sitting back on the weekends doing the basic you know um you know tinkering in the garage you guys are going out in the woods and and testing yourselves and uh, i know that only through pushing yourself can you really kind of refine that edge and when you do that how can you not feel a little bit better about uh, what you mean to uh, the people that care about you and respect you and and uh, this is so necessary Thank you. you. It it really is just giving giving people here a a perspective on like what's possible out there in terms of like, you know, you don't got to settle for the 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 day to day status quo. Yeah, and Mm -hmm. uh, God bless you guys for that. And I wish you you know nothing but health and safety and good decisions out there. Oh yeah, and uh, thanks, man. That's really really thoughtful words. Yeah, 
um, very, uh, I, that was, you know, one of the nicest things anybody said to us, mm -hmm. um, and what we're doing here mm -hmm. and genuine from the heart. So mm -hmm. thank you very much. No, that was I, nice, man. No, I, I just, I'm just glad I took a, took a second to look at it and just kind of feel yeah. it. And, and what you guys are doing is real serious and it's just going to continue to catch fire. And, and I got a little bit of it today with boots and just kind of the push that he was giving me and, and, uh, I mean, I just look at that thing, and, and, and sometimes I want to whatever, but, man, just what it means to our souls and, and uh, where we come from and, and, and the extremes, and uh, you figure it out. You find a way. You survive. You know, whatever. You know, make do. Make do. And uh, mm -hmm. here we are. We're going to get through this. You're my brother. You're with me. We're out here in the woods, and you're all I got. Yeah, that's right. And... Uh, I think like that is super unique and I love that you guys are highlighting that because uh, you know, it, it's tough to put yourself in those situations uh, and, and I can't say that I would right now and you guys are doing that and God bless you for that. Thank you. Thanks, Thank bro. you, Alaska. Thank you for the listeners. Thank you for yeah. all the support. Uh, we appreciate what everyone out there stay wild. You remember my speaking to you of what I call your over cautiousness. Are you not over cautious? When you assume that you cannot do what the enemy is constantly doing? The Alaska Wild Project podcast is brought to you by the following sponsors. Tailored Restoration 24-Hour Emergency Home Services. Helping Alaskans restore their dreams since 1972. Services include fire, water, mold, post-emergency cleaning, repair, and remodeling. Give them a call in Anchorage, Eagle River, Matsu, or Fairbanks. Hit them up at tailoredrestorationalaska.com looking to buy or sell a home look no further than alaska's number one real estate team at alaskashometeam.com decades of local experience knowledge and expertise in a competitive real estate market alaska's home team makes buying or selling your home a breeze give them a call today at 907-277-3777 lady with the plan your own Alaska event planner. From scouting the perfect location to planning the tiniest details. Specializing in event management and production for intimate social gatherings, retreats, birthdays, bridal, and baby showers. Find Lady with the Plan on Instagram. The Bait Shack. Located on Ship Creek upstream of the bridge. Can't miss the bright red shack. They are the go-to fishing gear rental and guide service on Ship Creek tight lines and fish on come hook into the action with them hit them up at thebaitshackak.com double shovel cider company located off of arctic and 58th handcrafted alaskan made colonial ciders they also have a tap room downtown on the corner of fifth and E. stop by today and taste an award-winning cider AKO Farms, located in Sitka, Alaska. Built from the ground up with concentrates as their single motivation. Find their products, such as their sugar wax, full spectrum diamond sauce carts and more at the Treehouse AK and other dispensaries around the state. Ask your local bud tender about AKO. TheTreehouseAK.com, located at 341 Boniface Parkway, Alaska's own and grown cannabis and CBD store. Ask the bud tender what the strain of the day is to get your 10% off. The Treehouse, where the culture lives. Marijuana has intoxicating effects that may be happy forming and addictive. Marijuana impairs concentration, coordination, and judgment. Do not operate a vehicle or machinery under the influence. There are health risks associated with consumption of marijuana. For the use of only by adults 21 and older. Keep out of the reach of children and marijuana should not be used by women who are pregnant or breastfeeding. Serrano's Mexican Grill, two locations, one on Tudor, one on Northern Lights. The Northern Lights location has their new tequila bar. Check it out. Also see their daily specials at serranosmexicangrill.com. Lawn Pro AK, Alaska's year-round professional property maintenance team. Services include snow and ice management, weekly lawn care, and more. Get your free estimate today at lawnproak.com. and act upon the clean. I say try if we never try, we shall never succeed. This proposition is a simple truth, and it's too important to be lost sight of for a moment. If we cannot beat the enemy where he now is, we never can. It is all easy if our troops march as well as the enemy, and it is unmanly to say they cannot do it.